Hey, good morning and welcome to this, the Microsoft Virtual Academy Jumpstart for Microsoft Intune. This Jumpstart is part of our Enterprise Mobility Core Skills Jumpstart series, and today we're gonna to be getting inside of what you guys need to know about Microsoft Intune in order to be able to really manage the environment and understand everything that's happening inside of the environment. This is the core skills, and it is a jump start, so the pace is gonna be pretty quick all the way through the entire day. If we take a quick look at the, uh, the agenda for this course, we're gonna start off looking at why Microsoft Intune. And to help me uh, through that conversation, I've asked an absolute true expert in Microsoft Intune to, uh, to come in and uh, explain that to us. There is nobody better, frankly, to be able to explain that. Then we're gonna have a look at um, core skills. We're gonna look at the, um, the 101 of what you really need to know. What are some of those foundational building blocks? Then we're gonna use those foundational building blocks throughout the course of the next four modules. And we're gonna take a look at mobile device management. Then we're gonna take a look at something called conditional access. We'll explain what that is as we start to get into that section. We're then gonna take a look at some of the policy configuration that you can put in place in order to be allow pe able to allow people to have access to corporate resources through Microsoft Intune. And then we're gonna have a look at mobile application management towards the very end of this jumpstart in the section just before you guys get to have the opportunity to go and get really hands-on with enterprise mobility and actually use a lab. You'll have my help during that lab in order to be able to go out, configure Microsoft Intune, really get yourself using uh, the product so you can get a really good feel for it. So we're gonna start off with um, the first module in this particular course, and we're gonna start off by talking to, uh, to Michael, who is the Partner Director of Program Management on Microsoft Intune, and frankly, um, he really is the guy who uh, knows everything about uh, what's happened inside of Microsoft Intune for the past few years, and also inside of uh, Configuration Manager, because, well, he owns Program Management for both parts of the product. So, Michael, welcome to uh, the MVA studio. Thanks a lot, Simon. It's great to be here. So you've been um, with Microsoft for about the um, about the last seven years, all up. No, I've been at Microsoft now for almost 19 years. Oh, okay. Uh, since 1996, I've been working in the management space uh, for the last seven. Cool. So that does pretty much mean that everything that's come out from Configuration Manager for quite a long time has been down a year. That's right. That's right. Me and a lot of the, the other folks who have spent a lot of time on it. Yeah, there is quite a lo large team be, uh, behind uh, Intune and Configman. So. Um, I guess the, the first thing that I really want to get out there is, mm -hmm. why have we built Microsoft Intune, and what have we really built it to excel at? So it's interesting. We've been on a, a journey with, with Intune for the last you know, five plus years. And when we, when we started off, um, the, the core idea we had uh, is, could we actually do PC management from the cloud? Could we do PC management uh, so that you wouldn't need to deploy any infrastructure within your enterprise and still get all the controls uh, that IT needed uh, to make sure that their employees could really be productive. So the first uh, waves of, of Intune, and then we, the, initially we called it wave one, and then we went to wave two, and then we switched to letters, and then we uh, switched to another numbering scheme, but way back in, in wave one, uh, we'd really thought about that the PC management of Windows XP and Windows 7 uh, from the cloud, which was a really radical idea uh, back in, in the, the 2010 timeframe. Um, and then later, probably after the, the first wave, we looked and said, well, you know, the, the devices that people really are trying to manage uh, that are internet facing are mobile devices. And at that point, we really tried to switch the focus uh, of Intune from being a PC cloud-based infrastructure management system to really managing those, those mobile devices with EAS and then with inbuilt MDM systems that started to exist on iOS um, and then later came along uh, inside of Windows. Um, and we, we also then really changed our focus to think about Intune as a standalone service that people would go to, to really thinking about how to unify the infrastructure to manage both PCs and mobile devices by integrating that Intune service with System Center Configuration Manager. Because you know System Center Configuration Manager has been just a tremendously successful product for Microsoft, and we know that you know a large fraction of the world's PCs uh, run um, on systems that are actually controlled by System Center Configuration Manager infrastructure. So 
with System Center Config Man being such a such a fantastic product, actually, and I've been using uh, SMS since SMS 1.2, actually. Mm -hmm. So config Thanks. Man for quite a long time. Yeah, I've been a been a long time customer now. I'm I guess poacher turned game gamekeeper at this point. Um, but let's just kind of think I, about. I the, think there's probably a better analogy. There. Yeah, there possibly is. Actually, <laughs> there's, uh, yeah, that, that's possibly something that uh, the LCA will have an issue with. Oh well, never mind. Um, but why don't we just take Configuration Manager and just I don't know, run some servers in the cloud that were running Configuration Manager. We actually did a lot of re-architecture. That's right. We, it, it's, a, it's a deep question. Um, we could spend the remainder of our time just talking about the, the trade-offs on that. I mean, fundamentally, I think that if you look at, you know, what's the difference between System Center Configuration Manager and, and, and Microsoft Intune today, one of the big differences you'll see is that System Center Configuration Manager is to some degree really all about the client. You know, we build a client for System Center Configuration Manager to push onto the device, and then we have infrastructure that actually controls that client. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Intune is really mostly talking over protocols to devices that we actually can't put agents on. Um, and that fundamentally is a real change in the architecture and the infrastructure of those systems. Um, also, you know, System Center Configuration Manager has um, unbelievable amounts of infrastructure built into it to solve um, very much corporate WAN network topology situations. You know, we, we worked with um, an airline who had a problem that they had uh, once a week flights that went into a remote Pacific Island. Um, and the flight went into the Pacific Island, uh, the plane landed, and the airport agent needed to go up and roll up on a cart that was battery powered uh, to the side of the airplane uh, and kind of check people's luggage or check them in. Uh, and then when the plane left, they put the cart away and they didn't go touch it for another week. And so the problem was is the cart had a PC on it and that cart had a connection over a satellite line um, and they wanted to make sure that they had the right updates on that cart at all times and it was really the right system. Um, and boy, that's a problem that you're not going to get to uh, with with uh, something like Microsoft Intune, uh, because it's just it's really a totally different use case. So we did a bunch of work around WAN optimization and dealing with the difference between satellite links versus uh, classic ISDN links or just uh, regular uh, internet links. So it was just a totally different problem. So when we looked at uh, what problems the infrastructure in SCCM was trying to solve, it was fundamentally a different set of problems than what we're trying to solve. Um, with with Microsoft Intune. So we really started from uh, a different code base where it wasn't about uh, creating awesomely large SQL servers that you could have you know, the most cores and the most memory and the highest, uh, highest bandwidth network, but really trying to build a system that could be a scale out, uh, internet scale infrastructure built on top of Azure. And I guess one of the one of the really really good advantages of building it on top of Azure is that actually we have the ability to integrate with other parts of Azure as well. So um, Intune uses Azure Active Directory to a um, really large degree to understand various things, and we're making more investment in that area as well. Right, absolutely. I, I think that, that one of the, the biggest misconceptions that I think people have of Intune is they say, oh, uh, Intune is an MDM just like, you know, name your other favorite MDM. And we say, no, you know, really, uh, Intune is part of an all-up Microsoft Enterprise Mobility Suite, which incorporates identity, uh, device management, and productivity, and the productivity services that come with O365. And you really need that totality of the solution uh, to really land uh, the right mobility story within your, your enterprise. You, just before we were, we were talking, just before we came on air, and there was, a, um, it was an interesting phrase that you use around um, the fact that we've We've built Microsoft Intune to uh, not so much manage devices, but to enable secure access to resources. Right. So, I think the misconception is that that Microsoft Intune is just another MDM that's about setting policy on devices. But really, um, Intune is all about you know enabling people uh, to get at their corporate information while keeping the corporate uh, information protected. And and one of those things that we've invested in that's specifically. Um, connected to Azure AD is actually um, conditional access control, mm -hmm. which which really strongly have re leverages the um, the identity component of Azure AD. Well, that's right. I mean, it, the 
the strongest differentiator when I talk to folks about Microsoft Intune is really around uh, conditional access and the way that we end-to-end -end, uh, deliver an awesome solution with Office. And that really does require an identity stack, uh, a device management stack, the productivity applications, and the productivity services to all work together. You know, the, there's this fundamental transition uh, that we think is, is going on in the market right now where you know, the, let's say even the corporate world from three years ago was I have an intranet, I have all my corporate resources behind that uh, intranet, kind of behind that perimeter, and I have devices that effectively join into that perimeter. I have domain joined PCs that have access uh, to uh, that corporate information because of the fact that they're positioned within that perimeter. And even the mobile device management uh, techniques were often, hey, let me have this internet-facing device and use VPN or use some other tunneling mechanism to effectively make it seem like that mobile device was actually uh, back a part of that perimeter. And now the world is really in this, in this different place where, you know, with O365, your corporate data and your corporate applications are really on internet-facing uh, services. And your devices are internet-facing devices. Um, and we see more and more companies actually moving away from intranet uh, style networks to more open internet connected style networks. And so the question is, if you no longer have perimeters as a way to protect uh, the data and to protect uh, the devices, what do you do? Mm -hmm. And so the work that we've done across the whole EMS and ECM suites is really about uh, protecting data and enabling mobility in this world without perimeters. And I think the, um, some folks kind of get really stuck uh, when they're thinking about this because they, they're very fixated on the old mechanism and, and think that just taking a VPN and providing VPN to a particular app on a device is the very best way of being able to do that. They don't necessarily think that they can change the, change the playing field somewhat here and actually say, actually, let's control access to that resource wherever it is. Mm -hmm. I quite often come across folks who have set up some kind of um, very strange situations where they have a cloud service, but in order to access the cloud service, you've then got to VPN back into something on-prem so that it can run through the on-prem proxy server in order to then go and access something, because that's what they, they feel makes it secure. It's a, it's a strange world. Well, the, the IT folks who I talk to are super smart guys, and they've well understood the business requirement to keep the corporate data protected. Uh, and the mechanisms they use with VPNs or reverse proxies or putting the ADFS server behind the firewall, um, that's, that's been historically the only way to go protect that data. And we're trying to say that there's potentially a better way to do that where you still have internet connected devices and internet facing services and you can guarantee that only devices that are well managed or applications that are well managed can get access to your corporate resources or services. I mean, because that's fundamentally the business requirement. So it's not, hey, the business requirement is that I have two perimeters and that I do this crazy VPN thing. The business requirement is to keep the corporate data corporate and to not delete kids' pictures arbitrarily. Yeah, that is one way of really getting yourself into trouble, actually, is to delete the, <laughs> delete the boss's kids' pictures off of yeah. his device. That's a, that's a very bad place to be. Um, so do you think it's now is kind of like one of the, the best times for these guys to be learning the new set of core skills that they really need going forward? If, if the, the corporate playing field is changing a little bit and we're bringing these new kind of, I guess, paradigms for um, security to, to market, I guess there's a, a bunch of things that people really need to start investing in right now. So I, I think there's a, there's a huge opportunity uh, for IT to really be the heroes here and really to dramatically reduce the cost and complexity uh, while these different devices are brought in. You know, I had a, um, I had a conversation with a customer three years ago uh, in November, uh, and he said to me, you know, look, uh, I'm one Christmas away from a nervous breakdown. Uh, because, you know, one more Christmas comes down, there's one more device that one of my employees gets uh, under the tree, and they try to bring that in and do work on it, and I just can't take it anymore. Um, and so, historically, again, the way that, that he dealt with that, uh, besides uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, was um, 
by creating these perimeters and really extending the metaphors that we presently have today uh, in the corporation into that mobile world. But we think fundamentally there's a better way. And that better way really does lead to simplicity and lower cost. You know, I, there's very few companies that I go visit that say, well, you know, what we'd really like to do is to spend more money on IT. Uh, there's just a constant pressure that we all have uh, to reduce cost and to make stuff more efficient. And there's a huge opportunity here to really rethink about this world of cloud first, mobile first, um, and think about how the infrastructure that, that we've historically built uh, can be really changed and upended and really dramatically simplified while creating really enhanced levels of security and protection. So one of the things that I want to um, make folks aware of is you get the opportunity to ask questions here. So please ask questions inside of the Q&A. Um, get, uh, get involved, ask questions, anything that, you, uh, that you'd like uh, Michael to answer um, whilst we're going through this. Please throw those questions in there and I'll, I'll uh, directly ask um, Michael some of those questions, assuming that they're going to be something I think Michael's actually going to be able to answer. Um, so in terms of um, thinking about um, integration with different parts of, the, of different services, Office 365 is obviously a, a really great um, integration point for us. Mm -hmm. um, we've made some pretty big investments with Microsoft Intune and Office, and most recently um, we actually announced the, um, the ability to do um, mobile device management directly through Office 365 as well. Mm -hmm. what, was the, what was that kind of driver behind doing that? Well. You know, when we look at uh, the number of devices under management today, uh, I think anybody who has a view of, of mobile devices would say that the single most popular uh, MDM tool is Exchange Active Sync. Mm -hmm. um, and even still today, uh, even in high security deployments, we see that the base capabilities of deploying a device level pin, uh, forcing encryption, doing uh, email account configuration, uh, that's really, an incredibly core set of features that many, many customers really need. So the question is, well, you know, what's the uh, what's the step above Exchange Active Sync? And the conversations that that we had uh, with the leaders in the office team coming up on probably two plus years ago, uh, thinking about uh, MDM for O365, they said, you know, we want to extend uh, the capabilities of of Exchange Active Sync, and we have a couple scenarios in mind. You know, we want to uh, extend the EAS uh, ABQ, the Law Block Quarantine uh, system, so that you can only deliver uh, email on a device that's well managed, because that's one of the real limitations of, of ABQ today. You open it up kind of for a given mailbox. And, mm -hmm. um, so they said we want enhanced control, and that was. Effectively, that was uh, the early view of, of what conditional access was going to be. So they wanted conditional access. The other thing that they wanted um, was being able to detect if a device was jailbroken. So, and they, they knew that, that doing that across iOS devices and Android devices and Windows phone devices was going to require them, effectively the O365 team, to do investment uh, in MDM in the same way that we, the Intune team, had done that investment. So what we were thinking was, is how can we take uh, the existing user experience and the existing systems that exist with Exchange Active Sync today and extend them with native device management and give incrementally more uh, control to the admin without turning them all into device admins? I mean, in effect, uh, with the MDM for O365, it's really targeted uh, towards the administrator who's administering Office and wants to uh, wants to have some control over the devices they manage. It's not really focused on the people who are the device managers mm -hmm. who are controlling a broad set of services on that devices on the on those devices. So, it, this was a really good way to extend the underlying capability of Exchange Active Sync while not turning every single Office admin uh, into a device admin. Yeah, I think it's a it, it's a very interesting place to to be looking at it because, you, as you say, there are so many devices out there that are just Exchange Admin Sync managed, and actually um, that causes you some issues. You can't do, say, a um, a selective wipe mm -hmm. on that type of device if it's only managed by Exchange Active Sync. So it puts it into a um, a really interesting situation there. We've had a question that came in, which I think we kind of we've kind of skirted around and answered it a little bit, but I just want to be really crystal clear about it. Okay. Um, the question is, what devices do we actually manage through Microsoft Intune? What are we capable of managing? Um, 
Well, we've mentioned that we actually do manage iOS. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, mention, uh, we haven't really mentioned anything else. I guess it's kind of implied that we manage Windows. Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so we manage uh, iOS devices, we manage Android devices, um, and there's a, a variant of our agent that's specifically authored uh, for uh, Samsung's Knox standard platform, so we can do some additional uh, configuration on that. Uh, we manage uh, Windows Phone devices, and we can manage uh, both Windows RT and Windows x86 devices uh, with inbuilt MDM support, or we have a native, uh, or we have a, um, a Intune PC agent that you can deploy on Windows 7 and above PCs to manage through Intune. Yeah, so we really can basically manage almost all of the most popular device types on the market. There's nothing that's particularly um, particularly out there that we can't really manage at the moment. Well, I mean, people do ask us at times, uh, do you manage uh, BlackBerry devices? And we don't. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Just can't do everything. Yeah. Uh, and that's a platform that we've, we've chosen not to support. Yeah. So um, in terms of um, what we can actually kind of where, where Intune fits into the kind of the new cloudy world. One of the things that I um, that somebody's asked is whereabouts could you use Intune instead of um, some of the traditional domain services that you'd have on prem? So I guess that question is really asking uh, in terms of a mobile context, where does um, Intune fit? Does it kind of I, I kind of think of it as being very similar to group policy instead of a, an on premises kind of environment? Right. So it, it's interesting to compare um, you know group policy. Uh, to to Intune because it, group policy to Intune is not really the right uh, underlying comparison. You could think of group policy in Windows compared to uh, what we call the OMA DM agent in Windows or what the core MDM properties that are exposed uh, in in iOS because that those are the core set of properties that can be managed um, on on the device. Um, and if you look at well, let's you know, let's take Windows specifically and say, well, what's the comparison between what you can manage uh, with with a Windows 8.1 system with the inbuilt MDM system uh, versus managing that Windows 8.1 system that maybe domain joined or is getting group policy commands um, or uh, is using a full SCCM agent on the device. I mean, typically. Um, you know, to me, it starts from the beginning of the, the workflow or the lifecycle of that device. You know, if you're expecting that on Windows that you have a base image that you're deploying uh, to those devices, likely Intune is not the right place for you. Um, you know, if you want to uh, re-image devices, and if that's something that you find yourself doing uh, quite frequently, um, and, you know, if, for example, you have a, a broad set of very complex Win32 software that has a lot of dependencies that you need the full application model and SCCM to manage, um, that's likely uh, Intune is probably not the right place for you to go, or it's not um, it's not best for you to use the Intune service to manage those PCs. I'd use SCCM to manage those PCs. Um, so the the other big qualification is if you look at group policy, I think there's at last count, and it's hard to even count, there's probably more than 20,000 group policies that are accessible uh, in the system. You know, I used to work on, on Internet Explorer back in the late 90s and early, early 2000s, and I think just in Internet Explorer, there's more than 5,000 GPO settings. Uh, and those settings are not all obviously exposed uh, through the inbuilt MDM agent mm -hmm. uh, in Windows, uh, for better or for worse. We're really trying to reduce some of the complexity around yeah. managing managing those endpoints. So. Again, if your workflow starts with imaging, likely in SCCM. Uh, if you're looking for really granular GPO control uh, to have kind of tight lockdown. Um, another way to think about it is if your devices that you're managing to on Windows, if you're likely pushing people to standard user and they're not uh, admin on the box, that's likely not. Uh, you're likely, well, you want more control on that device than maybe uh, the inbuilt MDM system uh, would give you. There are some cases where you can use standard user uh, with MDM, but that, that's a, a, an interesting trigger point mm -hmm. to look at. And then just the, the mass of software that you deploy. If it's really simple software or you're deploying universal apps, uh, that's reasonable. If you have software that has heavy dependencies, heavy codependencies, you likely need a more complex app model that you get with SCCM. 
And just talking about the, the app models a little bit, obviously the app model is completely different from, from mobile devices. Um, and that kind of brings us to the world of mobile application management as well. Mm -hmm. um, with, that's one of the areas that you're making heavy investment in Microsoft Intune right now is the, the mobile application management. One of the mm -hmm. questions that we had inside of the chat from, um, I'm sorry the name's got off my screen right now, otherwise I'd say your name. Um, but one of the questions we had was, um, when you add mobile applications to a managed device, say iOS, um, do they get containerization? Does that actually kick in? And the answer is yes, but how does that kind of, how do we think about that? Well, so this is actually a really great question. We, we talk about this internally all the time. Um, I, I think about it uh, like concentric circles, mm -hmm. where kind of at the first level, and let, let's talk about iOS, because iOS and, and Android are, are just Very really nice. different beasts, so I'll just, I'll reserve my comments to iOS for now. So. With iOS, uh, kind of at the, the core of that circle is a store-delivered uh, application. So let's say I go to the store uh, and I install you know, OneNote from the, from the store, right? just as an end user. Yeah. Um, that gives me uh, quite a degree of data protection. Uh, and this is both the strength and weakness. You know, as, as folks know, uh, iOS doesn't have a file system in the same way that Windows has a file system, so that application is restricted to writing uh, to selected shared folders, um, plus the data storage that's associated specifically uh, with that application. So in effect, that application by default is uh, in a pseudo container. Um, the, the level above that uh, that we think is when that application is actually delivered over a, an MDM channel from Intune or, or from any other uh, MDM. And there, you get some additional controls because IT can both push the application to the device, but IT can remove that application and its associated data um, with that device. But you still have the problem um, that data can often be saved from that application uh, and put onto the local device. Mm -hmm. um, and it isn't necessarily encrypted. It's encrypted if there's uh, encryption under pin uh, set up on the device, but there's not specific app level encryption. The third ring outside of that is when you have an application that's been enlightened uh, with what we call the Intune uh, SDK, which actually understands those application management policies. There you can set additional policies to, in, to limit whether the application can save or save data locally, can actually save uh, to other services. And we also can restrict clipboard operations so that you can't easily move data from, let's say, that, that corporate OneNote application to uh, maybe a, a personal Twitter app. Yeah, you need, the, you need that kind of Right. Control, don't you, at that point? So again, there's basic capabilities that are provided by the operating system, more capabilities when the application is delivered over MDM, and that yet more capabilities uh, delivered when the application is enlightened to use an SDK like the Intune SDK to do application management. So it gives us a, a lot of capability around being able to, to manage application lifecycle. We can do things that, such as install, we can do things like remove, we can remotely remote wipe the data if we need to. So it does put us into a, um, a really very good position with most of the um, most of the mobile devices that are out there. Um, in terms of, uh, there's another a kind of follow-on application, kind of follow-on question from that um, around specifically what would happen if you had a, um, a link inside of a document and that document was a corporate document. Do we have mm -hmm. a, a, a specific way of being able to manage um, I guess I guess the worry there is, could there be some malware on the device which would be specifically targeting the browser application? Right. Something that fits into that space. Right, absolutely. So we have, uh, on both iOS and Android, we have what we call the managed browser. And for those, those enlightened, that third tier uh, of applications, you can indicate whether links from that application that would otherwise start a browser whether they open up only in the managed browser. And that managed browser is a special type of application that actually is enlightened with the Intune SDK where those same corporate data policies uh, can be applied to it. Cool, so it's, a, it's just an app you need to go and get, basically. That, that's right. Made it really simple, <laughs> um, which is a, a fantastic kind of approach. And it's one of the things that I, I really like about Intune is that actually you mentioned it with, the, um, with what we've done around um, the MDM policies we have in place. There could be hundreds of thousands of policies but actually we've got the ones that really matter mm -hmm. and that's a, a really good position to be in. Um, 
I know you guys have asked lots and lots of questions. I actually can't keep up with the uh, the flow of questions inside of the um, inside of the Q and A screen. There are a lot going on in there. So um, any of the questions that we don't get answered, I'll be answering um, after the event on my blog, and we'll try and answer a few more during the um, the later um, sections of this uh, particular jumpstart. Michael, thank you very much for uh, for coming in and Thanks, talking Simon. to us all of that. I think um, hopefully you guys have a good um, bunch of reasons there why you should be um, thinking about looking at Intune. Over the course of the next five modules, we're actually going to give you some of the skills that you need and some hands-on activity so that you can get right inside of Microsoft Intune. We're going to take a 15-minute uh, a break while we just um, change people out here, let, uh, let Michael get on his way for the rest of the day, and uh, I'm going to bring out uh, Mike Donoski, who's going to help me um, through the rest, of, um, the rest of the day. Thank you very much, and join us back in around about uh, 15 minutes. Hello and welcome back to the Microsoft Intune Virtual Academy Jumpstart. Um, we are going to be taking a look in this section at uh, Microsoft Intune Core Skills 101. We're going to level set on some bits of information that you really need to have in your head before we continue through the rest of the modules inside of the course. However, before we get there, I want to introduce my awesome co-presenter for this course, Mike Donoski. Uh, Mike, tell these guys about yourself a little bit. Yeah, so uh, I am on the Intune team, um, working in, it's called the CXP team, the customer experience team. What we do is we work with the support team to make sure that the product is supportable, make sure we have some quality there, um, and then also help uh, with some of the escalations that they have. Um, before that, you may recognize me from some Windows Phone stuff that we were working on. I was doing Windows Phone um, tier 3 customer support, um, and also getting out and helping some of those customers who are starting to actually tackle deploying Windows Phone and Intune and some good uh, MDM, EMM uh, goodness. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. Cool. So during the course of this module, we're actually going to take uh, a look at explaining some of the acronyms that you'll find uh, inside of this particular space, how you level set with those. We're then going to bring in some of the identity concepts that you'll need to be able to understand in order to be able to successfully manage Microsoft Intune. We're going to talk about how you can integrate it with Configuration Manager in a hybrid configuration. Most of what we're going to cover inside of this course is going to be using uh, Intune standalone rather than hybrid. But in terms of um, things that you can do there, there's also some on-prem connectors that you might want to know about if you're going to be doing things like integration with Exchange, with certificates that you'll actually be able to deploy from Intune in order to have some of that behind the firewall kind of uh, involvement. Then we're going to take a look at some of the things that you need to know around device applicability. Certain things don't apply to all devices, as we kind of hinted to a little bit earlier on with Michael. Then we're going to have a look at uh, users, what you do in terms of user management inside of uh, Microsoft Intune. And we're also going to look at uh, licensing, not from the point of view of how do you buy the product, but how do you apply the licenses to make things become uh, actually usable inside of the Intune environment. So to start us off, we're going to talk about uh, Enterprise Mobility Management, or rather the acronym SOUP that is uh, Enterprise Mobility Management. Yeah, so if you've been following the space for the past few years, uh, probably what you're most familiar with is down here on the bottom left, we're talking about Mobile Device Management, or MDM. You hear MDM thrown around like everyone knows what it means, but some people get caught up with it. Um, and then basically what started happening is as these products started evolving and adding more features, you get things like mobile application management, where you're now deploying applications, controlling those deployed applications. Um, and then moving over, we've got mobile content and information management, which is really how do you handle your data? How do you get stuff, how do you get data to your device, mm -hmm. protect it while it's there, and then make sure that the user can access that data uh, from the cloud or from wherever um, it is stored. And so the term we use to sort of describe this entire large scenario is Enterprise Mobility Management, or EMM. You'll hear that uh, sort of talking about all of the different um, features that are for essentially a non-domain joined device, as Michael was talking about earlier, uh, a mobile device that's roaming, how does it get data, how does it stay secure, how do you tackle all of those questions. Yeah, and if we start to think about where Microsoft Intune actually fits in um, to this particular piece, Microsoft Intune is kind of our enterprise um, our, uh, mobile device management and uh, mobile application management part of the story. Additionally, there's the, um, the MCM and the MIM parts of the story, which are really filled in by, um, by OneDrive as part of uh, Office 365. So we kind of integrate everything um, back together to, uh, to form quite a, 
um, a holistic solution. So Intune is our, our answer to um, the EMM question. Um, but we also need to be thinking specifically about how identity interplays with uh, Microsoft Intune as well. And we have to um, very uh, carefully think about the way that we're going to be doing our deployments of Microsoft Intune because there are components that we want to be going and deploying on premises. And we do need to decide up front what we're going to be doing and what we're going to be deploying. If we want to be doing a configuration where we're going to be in hybrid mode, integrated with Configuration Manager, then actually we need to have made that decision up front as part of our architecture discussions uh, with the business around what we're doing with ConfigMan. So in terms of identity, um, we actually le leverage and heavily lean on Azure Active Directory um, in order to be able to provide the identity for uh, Microsoft Intune. In fact, uh, if you are joining us from our previous episode of this Jumpstart series, you'll actually already know a lot about Azure Active Directory. If you aren't jumping us, uh, joining us from uh, one of those previous entries, then go away um, for a little while after the end of this Jumpstart and binge on all of that content that we created in the previous, uh, in the previous Jumpstart. It's available on demand right now. And that's one of the intentions of this entire Jumpstart series, to make sure that by the time we do the next episode, the previous episodes are available for your binging pleasure. So what does actually Active Directory do? Well, it provides us with um, a bunch of, uh, a place to store all of our identities for our users inside of our Active Directory. Now they can come from our on-prem directory and be synchronized, or they can be in a cloud-only configuration, existing purely, as the name suggests, in the cloud. Either configuration is perfectly fine for Microsoft Intune and it works in exactly the same way. All Intune is doing is actually looking there to say, hey, is this user there? Are they enabled for Microsoft Intune? And are they allowed to do device enrollments? It's also the same configuration that you'll have in place if you're already using Office 365. So there's no need to sweat any of that small stuff around. Do I need to create a second Active Directory for Intune? Do I need to break it off and create something completely unique just for device management? The answer is absolutely not. It's all completely integrated together. What I would suggest you do, though, is actually have a second um, tenant, as we, as we actually call them for, um, for Azure Active Directory, which is your test tenant. It's your lab, because you want to be testing things out in a non-production environment as much as you possibly can to make sure that they're working in the way that you're actually um, setting this stuff up. You want to mimic that, obviously, as closely as you can to your production environment, but you also want to make sure that it's not using things like the exact same domain names. That kind of stuff really isn't going to work. So you have to be a little bit careful with that. We see when we talk to customers, uh, a lot of the feedback that we get is that big first hurdle of how do I get my users into the cloud mm -hmm. so that I can start using cloud services with them. Um, so like Simon said, if you're already using Office 365, you've already cleared that hurdle. If you're thinking about using Office 365, you're probably already starting to think about how do I, okay, how do I actually engage the cloud? How do I get my people out there? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it might just be if you're a small company and an on-prem, domain, you know, just export your users out to an Excel file and load that up. You can do a bulk add straight into Intune. And if you do that in Intune, it's actually the it's kind of confusing because there's a lot of portals and a lot of our cloud services. When you do that in Intune, it's actually just creating Azure AD users. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a and that's a really great way to be able to actually build out a um, a, a test tenant as well is to take a an export to a CSV and be able to import it. Also, you don't have to have implemented synchronization. It is possible to have it completely standalone and have users just have to remember two usernames and passwords. But there's a lot of advantage for actually integrating the two things together. So when we start thinking about hybrid configuration, uh, the very first thing we need to do is to um, set up the MDM authority. So this is another thing that we get uh, a lot of case volume on. Mm -hmm. um, and what it is is essentially when you create a new Intune tenant where you're basically adding that service on top of uh, O365 if you're already using that, um, or if you're just creating a new test tenant, uh, one of the things you have to pay attention to and one of the first early steps you're going to do is set your authority. Um, and if you're just going to use cloud, that's fine. Go ahead and you can go in through the Intune portal and set your MDM authority as Intune. Um, if you're planning on going to ConfigMan later, though, Configuration Manager for the integration and installing the Intune connector role and all that stuff, 
don't set your authority for standalone yet, or standalone being the cloud only just through the Intune portal. Because what's going to happen is there's no easy way for you to by yourself go ahead and change that over later. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to use two tenants for testing, test something out in standalone and then integrate it with your config men later, it's a great idea. Just like Simon was saying, be sure that you have your domain names you want to use uh, straight before you start digging into that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we're saying here. Just be sure when you're setting the authority of the tenant. Uh, a lot of times people are like, oh, yeah, 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 I'm clicking through. OK, oh, I just set my tenant for cloud. And this is going to be my domain yeah. for, uh, for configman hybrid. Um, <clears throat> and of course, each of them have their benefits uh, and drawbacks, depending on which one's right for you. And there's tons of content out there to help you make that decision. Yeah, there is a, there's an absolute load of content on TechNet, actually. And, um, and we'll give you some links a little later on in so that you can actually find out some of the places where you need to be thinking about how do you make the decision. But probably the one that I think is the most important for folks out there, if you've already got Configman deployed, um, Configman 2012, 2012 R2, then actually it makes a lot of sense to integrate with Microsoft Intune because it means that you're going to get a single pane of glass over all of your management. Now, probably the biggest reason not to integrate right now is that not every single piece of the stack which has been developed for Microsoft Intune is actually available to flow back down into Configuration Manager just yet. We are working on it, but there are some capabilities that are only available right now in Intune Standalone, and they'll be available in a little while inside of Intune, uh, sorry, inside of Configman on-premises. When you actually go through the, um, the course of doing the lab at the end of the jump start today, um, you'll actually go through the process of setting the MDM authority as well on your Microsoft Intune tenant. So we're not going to dive into too much more detail here, but you'll get a little bit more of an idea as we move into that section. I also mentioned some of the on-premises connectors that we can have um, that are available from Microsoft Intune. Now, there's, um, there's a couple of these which really make life um, a heck of a lot easier for you. The first one is that um, we have the ability to, as I was talking about with Michael, do conditional access. Conditional access involves us making sure that a device is, I guess, um, healthy um, in terms of MDM capabilities before you provide access to your email. Now, if your email, for example, is on-premises using Exchange, then you'll actually want to go ahead and get hold of the Exchange 2010, sorry, the Exchange connector um, for Microsoft Intune. It's just available through the Microsoft Intune portal itself, so it's pretty easy to find. You need to be running Exchange 2010 SP1 or later on-prem in order to be able to use that. If you're using Office 365, then obviously we've already deployed all of that for you, so we can just connect with the service-to-service -service connector, and there's nothing to deploy on-prem in that particular case. There's also um, a connector which is slightly outside of the scope of everything that we want to talk about inside of um, today's jumpstart. It really is kind of like a, a level 400 topic to get into this, and that is around um, certificate deployments. And we have something called the Endes connector, which allows you to connect up to your Endes infrastructure on premises in order to be able to issue certificates out to uh, mobile devices more easily. Um, that's kind of a, a tricky thing to do, and actually, we've made it very easy, but you know, it's actually a pretty deep topic. You really need to know how certificate services um, are working in your on-premises environment. So we've taken the decision not to cover that inside of this jumpstart, and we'll produce some extra materials um, a little later on, specifically on that uh, capability. Then we move on to um, device applicability. So something to notice and something that you'll uh, quickly see if you use standalone when you start uh, <coughs> managing devices is that not all the policies really support um, every device. Mm -hmm. For example, you can't disable Cortana on an Android device. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but as you start digging in, you'll see things like um, just some of the features of each platform. It doesn't really mesh up as well. And what we see a lot of the times in the hybrid configuration with Configuration Manager is the first the person goes there, they go, cool, I'm going to create my first policy, I'm going to go through and I'm going to click all these buttons. Uh, yes, I want to do this. No, I don't want to do that. I want all these different settings, and then they go and they hit and they deploy and they call us up because they say, hey, I've deployed this policy and, and I don't see anything on the device. Mm -hmm. um, and usually, so in the hybrid configuration, you have to actually go back in and look at the platform applicability report. And that's going to give you a summary of which settings are actually going to work on the devices that you're deploying to. It's a little easier in standalone Intune. and it's going to tell you right next to the setting. So if you're looking at it and you want to say, hey, I want to disable voice recording, you can go in and see, OK, I know this is going to work on the platforms that I intend for this setting to land on. Um, and how that works is each device uh, supports certain settings. 
And in the Windows uh, space, what we use are configuration service providers, or CSP. You'll hear us throw around the word CSP. If you stick around with us for the rest of the day, it'll be your new favorite word by the time we're done. Mm -hmm. um, but that's really what determines what's possible on the device for management. So if someone goes out and they develop a new feature for Windows, on the second hand, they're going to go and they're going to develop the CSPs to control that so that the Intune team can then go and create features in the UI um, to actually manage those features. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we're going to show you how to actually find those CSPs. And you can actually, if it's not quite written in Intune yet, you can go ahead and still yeah. manage that feature. That's going to be massive in the next uh, year or so when we start seeing new Windows 10 features flow out. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, a lot of you guys are on the Windows Insider program and seeing some of those cool things already. Um, but all that's going to be manageable with uh, configuration service providers through MDM. Yeah, and CSPs are um, CSP is a unique term to Windows. It's what we call it inside of Microsoft. But the other MDM, uh, the other device manufacturers out there have their MDM protocol specifications um, that actually list all of the things that can be configured through MDM. So we actually have a nice piece of flexibility inside of Intune in that we can actually just push out custom XML, um, which is exactly how the MDM um, services on the devices or the CSPs actually take the information. They just take the XML file and then they know what to do with it. So it's not just a Microsoft thing, it's available for everything. If you're completely new to um, managing devices other than Windows devices, this suddenly might seem a little bit strange to you because, well, frankly, we don't actually have control over what all of the other, uh, other vendors actually put into their software. Strangely enough, they don't actually always listen to what Microsoft says. There's a bunch of other players in the market. When it's Windows, we can make the kind of changes that we want to see inside of the platform. So if you're coming from a pure Windows bracket, background, you're going to have seen a lot of that kind of legacy where we have had that, uh, that kind of control for the past few years. Uh, so the next thing that we want to cover uh, as part of these, uh, this section on 101 is the different types of roles that you'll find inside of Microsoft Intune. Now the first thing is that we have um, role-based access control built into Microsoft Intune and there's a number of different roles that are really quite important to understand. The first one is the tenant administrator roles. Now, you can, we get different types of tenant administrators, and they have the ability to do different things with the tenant. And when we say tenant, we're actually referring to your Microsoft Intune or Office 365 or Azure Active Directory just for your organization. That is a tenant. So when we, we need to kind of think about that as differently from it's not your Intune account, it's your Intune tenant. Accounts or users are actually the things that you're going to log into the tenant with. So we have the ability to log in as a, uh, as a billing administrator. Um, they basically have the ability to make purchases, be able to check that the service is healthy. It's the kind of thing that you might hand out to, um, I guess, maybe somebody in purchasing um, who needs to have that kind of uh, communication with your Microsoft account manager. You then have global administrators. Global Admin is the, um, the default user account that gets created when you first create an account inside of your tenant, and it allows you to manage every single aspect of your Microsoft Intune tenant. Then we get down to Password Administrators. These are probably the, um, the kind of um, details that you might want to give to somebody who, I don't know, is, is an admin for a department, and they have the ability to um, reset passwords for those particular users. Obviously, inside of Azure Active Directory, we're auditing those password resets, so we know exactly what's happening and who's resetting what passwords. We then have service support administrators. Um, they're able to manage service requests inside of Microsoft Intune and also to be able to monitor the health of the service. And then user management administrators who have the ability to be able to create users, um, to be able to reset passwords, monitor health accounts, that kind of thing. Um, that might be the kind of user account that you'll be giving out to folks who are managing your service desk or your help desk. Outside of our tenant administrators, we have service administrators. Um, service administrators allow us to um, have either full access to the tenant, so in essence a service administrator will be able to see and do everything inside of the console, and they can also manage other administrators. Read-only access for service administrators means that you can literally give somebody access to your Intune tenant and they can see what's happening in there, but they can't make any changes. So that could be really a kind of a nice way to give training wheels to somebody so that they can start to understand what's happening inside of your organization, but not actually inflict any poorly thought out changes onto any of your users, thus creating additional service calls. And then finally, we have a very special um, type of user account, which is the device enrollment manager account. 
device, en man uh, device enrollment manager role actually allows a user who's been set up with that to enroll more than the standard five device maximum. Now, you can bring that device maximum down for a standard user, but the device maximum for a um, device enrollment administrator is actually 100 devices. And the idea here is that when you have to bulk enroll a lot of devices, you can use the same user account in order to be able to do that. You're going to want to set things like a very strong password on there, but in the, this case, it's a good way to be able to use, say, a build factory in order to be able to build and enroll devices. It's not the only way to do device enrollment. There's some other ways. We'll talk about those a little bit later on. But there are um, some good uses for the device enrollment manager. And then finally, um, in this section, we want to talk about licensing and enabling uh, the use of Microsoft Intune. <coughs> so um, there's a couple of ways that you can actually do this. Inside of Microsoft Intune, you actually, um, as a, a standalone mode or cloud-only mode, you have to individually enable and license each particular user for Microsoft Intune. Now, this is actually quite good because it gives you the ability to have really granular control over who can actually go and take a device and uh, enroll those devices with uh, Microsoft Intune. So you could say, for example, that inside of your company of uh, 100 people, you only have 40 Intune licenses, so only 40 people are allowed to do um, Intune MDM enrollment. The other 60 people are only allowed to have Exchange Active Sync policies down to their device. So you have this kind of mixed economy of um, where people are getting their policy from. However, if you need to do bulk enrollment of users, then actually it's, act it's pretty easy. You can do a couple of things. You can use the multi-select checkboxes inside of the UI, or you can use PowerShell in order to apply the licenses um, programmatically to um, everybody's accounts. Now, I'm not going to go through the exact PowerShell that you need in order to be able to do that. It's all nicely documented up on TechNet, so we'll point you into the direction of that documentation a little later on. And then in terms of enabling users for Configuration Manager, um, in hybrid mode, that's a little bit different. There, what we actually have to do is create a collection of the users that are going to be allowed to um, enroll devices into Microsoft Intune. And once we've created that collection, we can then enable that through the settings inside of Microsoft Intune. And again, it's really well documented how to do that on TechNet. It's actually very, very simple. And the wizard takes you through that as you're starting to set up a hybrid connection to Microsoft Intune. We're not going to go too deeply into hybrid connections during this jumpstart but I wanted to make sure you guys had um, some clarity on how you get people up and running, because it sometimes causes people to kind of expect that everybody can enroll a device suddenly because they're a user inside of the domain, but actually you need to have gone an extra step further. That's actually a great point that you brought up and you and Michael were talking about earlier as far as uh, you can have EAS, <laughs> Exchange Active Sync Policy, live happily with um, Intune users, where say that you only have so many people who all they need is really email, um, you can set those users up and they can happily go on just using email, but say that there's a, a core group of users who are using applications, they need VPN, they need all, this other, all these other great features, you can just roll that out to those users so you're not paying for every head in your organization to be using Intune. You can sort of scale it and use whatever makes sense for you. Yeah. So there's a, um, there's a couple of questions that just came up inside of the chat that I wanted us to, um, to very quickly uh, answer. The first one um, kind, of kind of did answer it, but let's just go back and reiterate it. Um, <clears throat> the first question was, can I use my Office 365 tenant along with Microsoft Intune? Yeah. That's yes. A, that's, so, a, that's a really simple answer. Yeah. So the way to think about it these days is uh, you hear about all these services that use Azure Active Directory, um, and I'm sure you'll start hearing about more. So the two that we're mentioning today, Office 365 and Intune. Um, there's a few more that you get with the EMS suite. Um, you've got Azure RMS and Azure AD Premium, Azure Active Directory Premium. Um, and the way that I generally think about this and the way it finally clicked for me is you think about Azure Active Directory as a box and that holds all of your users. And then you're thinking, OK, well, what services do I want to light up for these users? I want them to be able to have a productivity suite? All right, cool. These users are lined up for Office 365. Oh, I also need to manage these devices? OK, now here's another service that lives on top of this core system of Azure Active Directory, and now they're using Intune. Yeah. That's the way I think about it. Yes, you can use them together. You can use them separately if you want, um, but you can't 
tie them to the same Active Directory. You'd have to create a separate tenant. People have multiple logons. It gets pretty hairy pretty quickly. Yeah, and there was a there was another question as well, specifically about um, using Azure AD tenants. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Can I um, can you have two separate um, Microsoft Intune tenants talking back to just one um, Azure AD tenant? And the answer there is no. <laughs> actually, that's one of the things that you. It's one of the things that's actually very difficult to do. There's actually a um, a one-to-one -one connection um, between an Intune tenant and an Azure AD tenant, and between an Office 365 and an Azure AD tenant. There's only a a one-to-one -one connection that can occur there. On-prem with Azure AD, you could have a one-to-many connection to multiple Azure Active Directory forests in an on-prem environment. But one of the things we're trying to do with everything that we do inside of the cloud is actually to simplify your life as much as possible, whilst giving you as much, as much flexibility as we possibly can as well. Uh, another question that came up inside of the chat was, um, what are we, uh, what, what are the, what's, the, um, uh, what's the approach for when, um, uh, when I can um, wipe devices but uh, not delete the information on the device? Well, we're going to get to that a little bit later on, so I just wanted to clear that up. And we've also had a, a bunch more questions about integrating Office 365 um, and Microsoft Intune as well from an MDM point of view and all of the recent announcements about um, MDM in Office 365. Um, where is it? How do I do it? Um, where, where are the locations? So we're going to show you that, that in a module in a couple of minutes time as well. So that brings us to um, the end of this particular module though. So we've actually gone through um, some of the acronyms that you'll find inside of the EMM space and hopefully help you um, identify some specifics around that. We've talked a little bit around how um, identity interacts with um, Microsoft Intune. And we've talked around um, how uh, you can integrate with the, some of the on-premises components. We'll do a little bit more of that a little later on as well. We've also talked about some of the device applicability, how you can find out information about what devices are um, actually going to be taking which particular settings from Microsoft Intune. We've also covered users and licensing of those users inside of Microsoft Intune. So we're going to be back in just a couple of seconds with another module. So hopefully you can uh, continue watching. And uh, that brings us to the end of module one. Sorry, module two. Okay, so welcome to module three of the Jumpstart. Um, in this case, we're going to be talking about uh, Azure Active. Sorry, we're going to be talking about mobile device management and uh, some of the capabilities that are inside Microsoft Intune to enable mobile device management inside of your uh, your organization and inside of your tenant. The capabilities that we're going to be uh, talking about inside of this are specifically what comes inside of uh, Microsoft Office 365 um, from an MDM point of view. We're also going to show you Office uh, 365 MDM as well. We're then going to take a look at MDM inside of uh, Microsoft Intune, and we're going to show you the, uh, the MDM inside of Microsoft Intune. You will also get to use that a little later on inside of the virtual lab. And then we're going to have a look at how, um, Office 36, sorry, how um, Microsoft Intune interplays with Exchange ActiveSync and other types of policy. And then we're going to have um, a final look at uh, Office 360, at, uh, MDM for Microsoft Intune. So, what comes inside of MDM for Office 365? So, the ability to um, apply security policies to a device is the uh, is the primary thing. And you can think of this as sort of a uh, sort of the basic settings that you get with Intune. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're maybe not ready to make the jump to Intune, uh, you're not ready to add the extra licensing and all that stuff, um, you can start off with your Office 365 users if you're, uh, and get some of those basic security policies. But really, the two big points are the next two points here. Uh, selective wipe for Office 365 data. That's huge. People yep. have been asking about it forever and up until here. Uh, using EIS to wipe a device pretty much blows it away. Mm -hmm. um, not a very good solution, depending on the scenario. You know, sometimes you do get your phone stolen or you leave it in a cab or something like that, and it needs to be wiped completely. Um, but then when you find that device again and you see that all your personal data has been erased from it, that's another help desk call usually. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty, uh, as we were kind of mentioning with Michael, it is pretty bad when, you're, uh, when you wipe out your boss's um, 
uh, private photos, that's never actually a good thing. So one of the cool things about um, selective wipe of Office 365 data is that if the email profile has been managed by Office 365 MDM, then you can wipe out the email profile and just the email profile. And you can also wipe out uh, any other of the, uh, the components that are just related to Office 365. But it doesn't let you have completely granular control over wiping just particular applications that have been deployed, because there is no application deployment capability through the MDM that's built into Office 365. It is that step up from ActiveSync, though, that takes you into a, a, a more true MDM type of scenario. It's also a really familiar experience for the, um, for the end user. Um, we'll show you a little bit of this in a few moments time, but it's actually a very easy way for, um, for people to be able to kind of see what's, uh, what's happening um, inside of uh, their device. They get kind of an easy prompt to make them walk through mobile device management. And we'll actually show that in, uh, in the next module inside of the course, because it's exactly the same process as enrollment for Microsoft Intune. In fact, actually, everything configured for Office 365 MDM is exactly the same stuff that you configure for Microsoft Intune MDM. You configure the same DNS settings. In fact, the documentation points you to the documentation for um, Microsoft Intune. All of that stuff is exactly identical. So it's pretty easy to bring these things in. Office 365 MDM is actually in all of the commercial subscriptions. So if you have anything that starts with E or B, um, or an edu plan or a government plan, then you're going to have the ability to be able to do um, Office 365 MDM within those capabilities. So let's take a look at uh, actually um, what it looks like to be inside of the, uh, the Office 365 console and to be able to set some MDM policy. I'm going to just go down to my portal just here, and you'll see that uh, once you've been enabled for MDM, um, you'll find it inside of the, uh, the left-hand side, you have our ability to go to um, all of the different sections. You'll see the, uh, the mobile devices section just down here at the bottom, mobile devices. And inside of mobile devices, you actually find the ability to manage um, all of the MDM settings for Office 365. Now, the very first thing that we actually need to go and do to make Office 365 MDM work, um, and you can see that I've got a, um, a little splodge over here on the, uh, the right-hand side, um, we actually need to go and manage the settings for Office 365. So I'm just going to go into Manage Settings. And then there's a couple of things we need to do. Firstly, we need to do the domain configuration. So if I hit Set, uh, set Up or Learn More here, it's going to take me through doing all of those DNS settings. kind of think that's um, a little bit kind of um, easy for the scope of this course, so we're going to skip that through. Then we have the ability to go and configure um, the APNs, the Apple Push Notification Network, so that we can manage iOS devices. All we have to do here is hit Setup. That's going to start taking me through the, uh, the process of getting hold of a um, certificate request file, which I can then go and exchange with Apple, apple.com, in order to be able to get hold of a certificate that would allow me to be trusted to manage iOS devices. In this particular case, I'm not going to go that far, um, because this is a, um, a tenant that I share with somebody else, uh, and I don't want to use one of my um, organization's APN certificates. However, once I've got that in place, I can then go and configure my um, manage uh, my device security policies and access rules. So let's go and click on the link there, and that's going to load up the um, compliance settings. Here we go. OK, so you can see I actually have two different sets of um, rules in place right now. But before we go and do anything with those, I'm going to create a new rule. And I'll just click the new button. We're going to call this uh, new, new O365. MDM, and we'll hit next. Okay, so these are the device security policies that we can put in place for this particular situation. So we can require a password, we can prevent the use of simple passwords, um, we can require alphanumeric passwords, um, which soon very quickly becomes uh, quite cumbersome to start entering these things. Um, we can set a password length, um, we can set the number of attempts that we have to get the password correct. We can set things like um, password expiration, the kind of things you would expect people to have to have on their device. We can also set things like password history, how many devices are we going to remember. And then we get to, down to uh, a few of the, I would suggest, the cooler things that we can do inside of um, just this part of MDM. First thing is um, requiring data encryption on the device. Now, if it's an iOS device, as soon as you set a pin on an iOS device, encryption happens on that particular device automatically. So um, this tick checkbox is actually kind of redundant if you're managing iOS and you've also set a pin policy. 
in an Android capability point of view, you actually have to check this box in order to um, enable encryption of that type of device. Um, we also have jailbreak detection. So we'll use our jailbreak detection, which is built into Microsoft Intune, in order to be able to understand if a device has been rooted or jailbroken, because that's kind of really one of those basic things you need to be understanding so that you know you've got some kind of level of trust in the device security. As soon as a device has been rooted or jailbroken, you literally have no real um, ability to trust what the device is telling you. So you ought to be detecting that up front. Then this next section, uh, require uh, managing the email profile, um, which is needed for a selective wipe on iOS, um, is actually a really, really powerful checkbox. In this particular case, when we tick that box, if the user has already set up their own email connection, so they've gone into the settings, they've added an email account, typed in the details of the server, then as soon as the device enrolls and it detects that, it'll prompt them to remove that mail profile. But also, what will happen is because this is happening through Office 365, we know what the user's mailbox details are. So as soon as you check that box, we will automatically push down a supported mail configuration to the device. So that means that we can then, on iOS, um, actually remote wipe that email profile and just take out the email data and nothing more. So very, very cool. Then we have a couple of options around um, what will happen to a device when it doesn't actually meet up with our standards. Well, first time we'll report the violation, which can be useful. That's still going to allow people access to the environment. So could be helpful in some situations. You might want to just know that people are doing something naughty, but actually still allow them access to do it. And then finally, we have the ability to block access and report the violation. So we're always going to report bad things. Um, we can block the access, prevent people from having access to any corporate resources um, if they don't meet the requirements. I'm going to hit next here on this particular policy. <coughs> now we need to say um, what other things we're going to configure on the device itself. We could require the backup to be encrypted. We could say that uh, we don't allow photo synchronization. We could block screen capture, probably a pretty useful thing to be able to do. And we could turn off uh, removable storage and Bluetooth devices if we want to. Something to note about that screen, <clears throat> and something that we brought up a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. is that it doesn't necessarily, uh, so right there on require encrypted backup, that might not be applicable to, uh, well, this is for iOS. There's a really good TechNet article out there that tells you which devices support which of these settings within the uh, MDM management f within Office 365. <coughs> Yeah, and it's, it is very well worth diving into that, um, that particular piece of information as well, because you do want to know exactly what's, uh, what's applying to where. Um, then we have um, the ability to um, then go and deploy the policy. So we're going to need to say yes here if we want to go and deploy out to a group that we've created in advance that contains the users who we want to deploy the policy to. So let's just go ahead and quickly see if we can find a group. In fact, actually, I can't remember the name of a group, so we'll skip through that process. Hit next. That's going to say we need to provide one. It literally is a case of hitting next there, and then we'll be, um, we will have our policy deployed. So in this case, we deployed a, um, a policy called lockdown. So we've actually um, deployed uh, that policy out to some devices. Let's go and take a quick look at it. And we can see that in order to... Uh, see what the access requirements are. So in order for this device to have access to um, any particular pieces of information stored in Office 365, we need to have the password in place. We need to have a password length. Um, they have to have changed the password within 41 days. Um, we also have to have pushed down the email profile. So literally, if the device doesn't meet this set of criteria, we won't be able, they won't be able to have access to any e exchange email or anything stored on um, SharePoint on that device um, through the applications. Uh, let's go ahead and have a quick look at uh, managing the device access settings. And here, this is actually a, a really useful place to be able to see where, where the details are going to apply to. So in this particular case, we're actually going to say that if a device doesn't support the application of the policy, then we're going to block access. So in this particular case, um, Office 365 MDM supports Android back to Android 4.2. So if you had an Android 4.1 device and that was trying to enroll, at this point we'd be saying, ah, no, no access for you. You need to have a later version of Android on the device 
in order for us to be able to push down the policy and to be able to manage that particular device. Of course, there are certain groups inside of every company where those folks are the kind of people that, well, you want to make sure that they're always working. So you might create a group here which is just for your um, the most senior people inside of your company is a pretty um, common way for doing this. You might have some other people who always need to be able to enroll devices no matter what, and we take away all of the restrictions for them if that's exactly what we want to do. So it takes, gives us a lot of flexibility around the way that we, we do our deployment. Now when a device actually does its enrollment and we're looking at it for its conditional access, that information is actually stored inside of Azure AD as to whether or not the device is actually compliant at any one point in time. So again, you start to see one of those tie-ins between Microsoft Intune, Office 365 and Azure Active Directory. So that kind of takes us through um, Office 365 MDM. Uh, let's start thinking about uh, Microsoft Intune MDM. Yeah, so uh, the MDM features within Office 365 really just get you into the game. So you're starting to manage some of your devices, you're putting policies on them. Um, the big thing is that it's a lot, you have your selective wipe, which is massive, but it's, I don't know if, I'm sure a lot of you out there have tried to configure mailbox policy with an exchange before, and realize that it gets quite complicated very, very quickly. Um, so with MDM instead of Office 365, you now have the option to go in and do it per collection, user collection or user group, which makes it much, much, much more simple to have that fine grain um, management that you're really looking for. Now when you're ready to go to the next step and you need really comprehensive device management, this is where we're adding um, things like application management. Uh, we're deploying applications to these devices. And then also we refer to it as resource access profiles. So that's deploying certificates, um, VPN profiles, Wi-Fi profiles, assigned access, allow and deny lists, all this great stuff we're going to show you later. That's really what you get with, uh, with Intune, and that's really why you're going to make that jump. If that's the type of stuff that you're going to uh, want to do in the future, go ahead and hold off right now on setting up MDM for Office 365 until you start Intune going. Um, but if that's not really what you're looking for within your business, go ahead and use uh, the MDM features inside of Office 365 today. Yep. Uh, it is still rolling out, so if you don't see it there, just be patient. Yeah, that is actually a really good point. So um, it is, it is mid-rollout at the moment. Not every single Office 365 tenant has actually been enabled for mobile device management just yet. So if you don't see it inside of your tenant, don't worry. It's coming. It is available for some people, but it's really basically impossible for us to um, tell outside of the product team exactly who and which, which particular tenants have been enabled at this point for um, Office 365 MDM. But it is coming, don't worry. And the other things you get, resource access profiles, all the, all the extra stuff. Custom settings is a really, really big one mm -hmm. um, that I really like because that allows you to sort of work around and get the stuff that maybe it's not there yet, um, maybe it's a new feature, you can, you can start testing it today. Yeah. So we're going to go ahead and show you a demo of uh, the Intune. So we just showed you what MDM looks like within Office 365. And here on my screen, I've got uh, what it looks like within Intune. Hopefully, this is not new to many of you. Um, this is manage.microsoft.com. And we're going to go ahead and deploy some basic policy. So if we're going to go in here to configuration policies, we're going to see what looks pretty similar to what we just saw within Office 365. So I'm actually going to go down here to common mobile device settings. And here's something that I want to point out because a lot of people skip by this. We have create and deploy a policy with the recommended settings and deploy a custom policy. If you just want to get out the gate and just get a quick policy on a bunch of devices that are enrolled, Recommended settings is the way to go. Um, I would argue that you could almost do that without an IT staff at all, like if it's a small business owner mm -hmm. who's trying to do that kind of stuff. Um, you basically click Create Policy, and it puts a very basic security policy on all the enrolled devices. It's going to encrypt devices, four-pin password, the basic stuff. We're going to go ahead and create a custom policy. And this is not creating a custom setting. This is where we're going through and looking at the policies that are in in tune. So we're just going to go ahead and give it a name. No description at this point. Oh, more actually Windows inside Windows. So let me, uh, beautiful. There we go. Okay. And you can see some of the options that we have here. And you'll see that a lot of these are the same ones that we saw in 
um, MDM for Office 365. So minimum password length, simple passwords, all that good stuff. And as I mentioned earlier, um, to point out the difference between the two, this is that awesome part where you see Windows Phone uh, 8 Plus, Windows RT, Windows 8.1. This tells you directly right here uh, which devices this is actually applicable to. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in, if you're using the Configuration Manager tie-in, after you go through and click all of your settings, at the end you pick which devices you're going to be deploying to, and then it'll give you a small report telling you which settings aren't applicable. Uh, this, if you haven't seen Intune in about six months, I, I beg you to go back and look. It has, we just keep adding features and features and features. It's, uh, it's pretty awesome. And so once you're done with all of these inbox ready to go features, um, go ahead and hit save policy. Request is being processed. And just like we saw on Intune for Office 365, or, uh, sorry, MDM for Office 365, we get to pick our users, you can deploy it out to your collection, you go ahead and hit add, and it's ready to go. Um, Intune now also, I mentioned, you know, we've made a lot of strides in the past six months even, uh, uses push notifications. Mm -hmm. So basically what that does is it'll deliver a push package to an enrolled device, uh, which will then tell that device to go check in. Uh, so you get policy almost pretty quick. Yeah. Not instantaneously, but as fast as the internet will allow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which yeah. is awesome compared to some of the old sync times we see like a year ago is 24 hour sync times, eight hour sync times. Um, it can get used to be pretty brutal. It's, it's pretty good now. So uh, that is what it looks like inside of Intune, sort of just to give you that foil between what it looks like in Intune and Office 365. Okay, so um, <clears throat> that kind of gives you a, an, an idea of how it looks, um, as Mark says, between the two. We're going to go into more detail, obviously, um, a little bit later as we, as we move through more of the modules. But what about the, the interplay between um, our EIS policy and the other kinds of, the other ways of managing a device? One of the, this actually leads quite an interesting point to um, a question that came up in the Q&A a few minutes ago around migrating from other MDM providers. Um, what is the way that we integrate with um, EIS and other policy? So EAS and MDM can work happily together. You have your EAS users. They can go ahead and sign up, uh, create an email profile on their device, pull down EAS policy. It's going to be things like password protection, some basic encryption stuff, stuff that you've seen that goes essentially towards all the mailboxes in your environment, unless you go in and do some of those mailbox rules. Um, but most devices, well, all devices, only can have one MDM authority. Mm -hmm. And what that means is you can't enroll in Intune and AirWatch or Intune and MobileIron or something like that. It has to be one. Um, and so that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, you can't really do both at the same time. Yeah, it's, a, it's one of those things that comes up um, time after time when people are looking at migrations. They've decided that Microsoft Intune um, is the thing that they want to move to. They want to move to EMS. They find that EMS is a, um, a better deal for them with better features than one of those other products. And they're kind of thinking, how do we get there? Can Microsoft Intune just remove the other products for me and everything's going to be good? Well, the answer is no. Unfortunately, we can't. We're constrained by the abilities of the device. So if we want to take an iOS device and um, remove somebody else's MDM, that's actually got to be um, initiated either by the user, if they have the permission to be able to do that, or by the previous MDM authority, because we can't have multiple MDM authorities on the same device. So when you're thinking about your migration strategy from another product, you actually need to build that in. How do we do the unenrollment from a previous product to move to Microsoft Intune? Um, if you, um, once you've actually um, applied policy to a device, there's also, um, how does, a, how does a policy get updated or refreshed um, is one of those things that kind of comes into play. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on when we specifically cover the module on policy. Because there's, there are some things that you have to, have to think about that can lead to device tattooing, where something is actually stuck on a device because nothing um, is other than a completely, complete unenrollment of a device is going to refresh that particular policy. OK, so that takes us towards the end of uh, Module 3. And uh, we're coming up on the, 
on the module summary. So um, we've had a look at uh, MD Office 365 MDM. We've had a look at um, what it means to be able to go and make configuration changes in there. We've also had a look at uh, what we can do um, through Microsoft Intune and where they policies are the same, where they where they differ. And we're going to go into policy um, a lot more in the uh, the next couple of modules, but we wanted to give you that particular foil. And we know that Office 365 is um, on a lot of people's minds from an MDM point of view right now. So we wanted to explain how the two things fit together. Remember, if you've enabled Office 365 MDM, you have to actually give us a call and we can then change your MDM authority over to be Microsoft Intune um, if that's the way that you actually want to be going. So. If you're going to be playing around with Office 365 MDM, don't do it on the same tenant that you're using Microsoft Intune for, because that's going to cause you some uh, some real issues. So don't go down that route. Um, and then finally, we've had a look at um, Intune um, MDM, and we've had a look at how um, policies interplay a little bit with EAS and other policy areas. We're going to give you guys the chance to have a short break now, and uh, then when we come back, we're going to move into our next module um, of this uh, Microsoft Intune Enterprise Mobility Core Skills Jumpstart. Hey, welcome back. This is module four of the Microsoft Intune Enterprise Mobility Core Skills Jumpstart. And in this particular module, we're going to be taking a look at conditional access. Specifically, the things we're going to be looking at is first, what is conditional access? This is possibly uh, something which is a little bit new to you if you've um, never experienced Microsoft Intune and what it's capable of before. We're then going to look at how we can take the principles of conditional access and be able to protect company resources by using it. We're going to look at some of the platform and app applicability of conditional access because it doesn't kind of get picked up by every single set of circumstances. We're going to look at some of the compliance policies um, by the particular platform, and we're going to have a look at conditional access for Exchange Online, but through Microsoft Intune, not through Office 365 MDM, as we explained in the previous module. So let's start off by talking a little bit about what conditional access is. Conditional access is something that we've built into Microsoft Intune, as Michael mentioned in the first module, to make Microsoft Intune this kind of, give it the ability to really move away from just managing devices, but managing access to your corporate resources. So what conditional access does is it says, does your device meet this particular set of criteria? And if the particular set of criteria, which are the same kind of things that we've seen in the previous module with Office 365, so is, ping, is there a pin in place? Is it complex enough? Is the device encrypted? Is it rooted or jailbroken? If it matches the criteria that we're saying, hey, actually, there is a pin, it's not rooted, it's encrypted, whatever you need it to be within the, uh, the set of the policy, then we're going to allow it to have access to the information that's stored inside of the resources that we're using to protect with conditional access. We've made it really flexible so that you can actually determine which particular users, which particular devices get access to conditional access in resources inside of your organization. And it's much more flexible than what we've built into just the MDM with Office 365. It gives you that extra level of granularity and control inside of Microsoft Intune that you expect from Microsoft Intune. So as we start to um, take a look at this, there is no better way to explain how um, conditional access actually works than to take a look at um, it in action. So we're going to switch over now to a demo of conditional access to Exchange Online. And you're going to see something that you don't always see on a, uh, on a Microsoft Jumpstart. You're going to see uh, an iPad. So we're going to switch across to uh, the iPad display. And you'll see here that actually I can see my um, my inbox email. So this is the email um, application built into the iPad. And I've already been into the settings on my iPad, just as a normal user might do. And I've added my corporate email credentials. How did I do that? Well, I just typed in my, um, my username, my email address. In this case, that's Laurie. I've typed that information in. And then the device itself has been off. It's done the DNS queries. It's worked out where my Exchange server is. I've provided the password. Everything's been good to that point, and it's provisioned um, access to my Office 365 email inbox. Now, in this particular case, though, I have one email only in my inbox because conditional access has jumped in front of my connection and said, hey, your device isn't compliant. 
it's not got all the right policy in place. You need to go through the process of actually enrolling and becoming compliant. So in this case, it actually tells me exactly what I need to do. Two steps. Firstly, enroll my device. And secondly, go back and check that it's compliant. So let's just run through that. I'm going to go and hit the um, enroll your device link just here in the email. We'll see that it opens up a link into um, Safari. And obviously, it's telling me at the very top there that, they, um, that I need to go and get hold of the uh, Microsoft Intune Company portal application. So in this case, I'm going to hit open because I've, to save time, already downloaded the application onto my device, but it's just available from the App Store. And now you can see I'm signed in um, already into um, this particular company portal with the same credentials that I've used to enroll my device uh, into email. And now you can actually see that immediately I can see the other devices that are known to this account, this Lorepreneur account. So see my Android devices, my Windows phones, and my PC. And I can also see my new iPad device in the bottom left. So I'm going to go and tap that, and it tells me immediately that my device is not enrolled. So I'm going to hit that link where it says device is not enrolled. It's going to take me through the process of enrolling my device. And this is actually going to set the MDM authority on this device to Microsoft Intune. So in a second or two, it's going to take us back to Safari so that Safari can then proxy us through into uh, there we go, in through, into the install profile screen. This gives me the details about the profile itself. I'm going to go back, say, actually, we're going to install it. It's going to ask me for my PIN, which I'll just enter. And then it's going to say, do you want to install the profile? I'm going to go ahead and install that. It's going to generate the keys that are required on the device. OK, it's now telling me, warning. The, uh, the administrator uh, may collect personal data, add remove accounts and restrictions. This is all the information that, uh, that actually is built into iOS. We don't actually have control over this particular message. So that's iOS warning me as the owner of the device that some things might be managed my, um, by my device manager. Uh, I'm going to trust this particular um, company for uh, device management because I can see that it is my own company in this case. Now that that profile is installed, I'll hit done. I'm going to be taken back into Safari, and then from Safari back into the company portal. Might seem a little bit strange, but on an iOS device, we actually have to take you through those different settings in order to be able to um, take us back into certain things. And what's actually happening at this point in time is that my device is enrolled, and now that that's actually happened and the device is, uh, is actually um, configured, if I go in here, even though we still have that exclamation mark, we can see that actually what's going on is that we're checking device compliance. So right now, conditional access is being assessed on this particular device by Microsoft Intune and by Azure AD. So we're actually checking to make sure that things like pins and passwords are up to scratch. And if they're not, then we're going to tell the user that they need to change something. So here, for example, um, we might have had a message up here telling us that we needed to set a pin if we didn't have one. We might have seen a message saying that we needed to encrypt if we weren't encrypted. We might have seen a message that says you need to remove that email profile that you manually added so that we can provision the, um, the company um, provisioned email application. OK, all of that done. Hopefully, uh, it's telling me that my device is in compliance and it was last checked um, on April 23rd at 11.04 uh, a.m. So that's all good. I'm going to go back into my mail client now. And you can see here um, that once we've um, checked that it's already enrolled, it's confirmed. Now notice, the email just went away. Conditional access has kicked in. And I actually now have a situation where any emails that I receive will flow down to my device. We've been approved. That was conditional access in action, allowing me access to Exchange Online um, using the, uh, the built-in email provider. So that takes us to the end of that demo from a, uh, from a user point of view. We're going to show you in a few minutes' time how we actually set that up inside of Microsoft Intune to provide that level of conditional access. But it's not just Exchange that has conditional access there. We've also provided um, conditional access to SharePoint as well, so uh, OneDrive for Business, for example. So if I open the OneDrive for Business app, which is currently being deployed down to my device using an application policy, which again we'll show you a little later on, then actually we would start to see that I have access to um, that device conditionally as well. Very, very useful. So 
Mike, what kinds of resources can we protect with um, conditional access? Well, this is this is huge because when you were talking to Michael earlier, he said that the admin would didn't want to or the the CIO couldn't survive another Christmas because of all these new devices. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing that people do when they get a device is they go, oh, cool, this button says email. I'm going to go ahead and type in all the emails I know. All right, here's this one, this one. Oh, and here's my corporate one, because why not? And they don't think, hey, I'm introducing an attack vector, or hey, I'm introducing a data leak um, vector. And so that's where you can stop them and say, hey, um, real quick, right here, we saw that you tried to enter your email, whether it's uh, on-prem, if you're using Exchange 2010 or beyond. Um, or if you're using Exchange Online, uh, it's saying, hey, you know what? Um, we know this is your new device. Go ahead and enroll it if you actually want to hold this data on this device. At that point, the user really has a decision. They can turn around and say, oh, you know what? Maybe I don't want my corporate data on this device because you know I'm going to be my kids are going to have this. I'm going to it's going to sit on the coffee table. It's not a secure device. I don't want secure data on it. Um, or I don't want a password, stuff like that. That's the decision they get to make at that point. Um, and this, the other point of entry, like you mentioned, was OneDrive. So someone goes into OneDrive and they say, hey, I'm home for the weekend, uh, but you know, I just got an email on my mobile device that, um, uh, a different mobile device that does get corporate email, and I got to go over to my iPad and um, get onto OneDrive and check this Power, PowerPoint deck before Monday or something like that. They can then go through those steps uh, through that vector of OneDrive and SharePoint Online. Mm -hmm. So in order to get those corporate resources, they can then become managed, enroll that device so that everyone knows it's secure, and then uh, they can go edit those files as they need, say that they save it locally if they're allowed to, um, and then they, depending on the policies that are in place, they get done, they're like, all right, cool, I'm going to go ahead and unenroll this now. They can unenroll it and corporate data will be removed from that device. It's very cool. Yep. So you can do sort of the temporal, hey, I just need to do work real quick. I'm going to enroll, do this stuff, and unenroll. Or you can do the, hey, I'm going to use this device sort of as a mixed use device, like a, most uh, users do with their daily driver <coughs> um, cell phone or mobile device. Uh, so that's why it's here, really, so that you get away from that. I'm just going to put this on here. And then, I'm, you know what, I'm going to go trade it in or trade it to my cousin who, you know, uh, Wants this new iPad, and now it's got my corporate email on there. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. We need to make make We've sure we've all heard the control. stories. Yeah, and the the resources that we can protect um, from a uh, from an online point of view are actually Exchange Online, SharePoint Online um, can be protected. We just use the service to service connector to do that, and we can also protect um, Exchange on premises as well. So that entire flow that you just saw. Um, there on the iPad actually could be done with an on-premises Exchange server as well. It's not just um, linked purely to being able to do this on a um, Exchange Online or Office 365 tenant. In terms of the devices and the apps where we're actually able to use um, conditional access, Android 4.2, iOS 6, Windows Phone 8.1, and the mail application on Windows Phone 8.1 and later um, all understand um, conditional access, so they're good. And if you, the um, devices aren't up to that level, don't understand conditional access, then you can always choose to block access to um, any resources from those devices. We also have certain applications which are um, built in that, can, that will work with conditional access. So um, the OneDrive application on iOS and Android will work with conditional access. It understands conditional access, and therefore it knows to pass through the information, or rather request the information, um, about whether a device is, um, is going to be allowed to flow that information to it. Um, and also Office Mobile on Android is also um, capable of, um, of understanding conditional access. And if you see a few things there that you might be thinking, oh, they should be on that list, well, we're probably working on, uh, on getting those applications uh, conditional access aware. So um, hopefully we'll see something on that in the near future. So let's just dive into a little bit more of the actual flow as to what's happening for conditional access in Exchange Online. In this particular case, we've basically got about four actors in play. We have the mobile device, we've got Office 365, Azure AD, and Microsoft Intune. And when the user takes that mobile device, the very first thing they're going to do is actually go and attempt to make the email connection. So they're going to go into settings, they're going to manually add their email profile. The very first thing that Office 365 then does is it goes across to Azure Active Directory and says, hey, do you know anything about this user's device? And is it compliant? If it knows that it's compliant, it's going to say to Office 365, hey, that's absolutely fine, that's good. But assuming that it doesn't say that, we're actually going to quarantine the device. So it's not compliant. We won't push the, um, the information out to it at all. 
So whilst the device is in that quarantine state, the only way to remove it from the quarantine state is for the device to talk to Microsoft Intune and do an enrollment with Microsoft Intune. When we see the enrollment with Intune, we're then going to check to assess, assess compliance of the device. And then at that point, um, we're going to push that compliance information into Azure Active Directory. So Azure Active Directory always knows whether a device is compliant. And then we're going to grant access to the resource on the device. Now, what happens if compliance should change once access to the device has been granted? Well, the next time that the user attempts to access that resource, we're going to then go and check to see whether Active Directory is still saying that the device is actually compliant. And in the background, we're going to check compliancy um, every so often on the device as well. So what about conditional access for Exchange on-premises? Well, it's a slightly different setup here. So in an Exchange on-premises environment, what we're going to do um, is actually the very first thing is we're going to block any unmanaged devices. And we're going to tell Exchange on-premises that we need to block any devices that are not managed by Microsoft Intune. So when the user attempts to make that email connection, if the, user, if the device isn't known to Microsoft Intune, then actually Exchange is going to block it by default. So it's then going to be put into quarantine mode. And then the only way to get out of quarantine mode is to enroll with Microsoft Intune. Upon which time, Microsoft Intune then knows that the device is unblocked. And therefore, it pushes down a message to the Exchange server to say, it's now OK to unblock this particular device. Then email gets to start flowing down to the device, and access is completely granted. Now, at this point in time, there's no way to do something similar with, um, with SharePoint on-premises, but we do have the Exchange Connector for email on-premises. So there's a good way of mixing your, um, uh, your environments there. And if there's any Exchange admins out there, probably a word that you're going to be very familiar with there is quarantine. Mm -hmm. And you can think of conditional access as a very, very clever, logical way to allow those quarantine devices, where in, in days past, you may have to look at your logging, see who's trying to access your email, if you have that quarantine set up, and then do a manual investigation and say, do I know who this is? Oh, yeah, this is Bob over in, uh, you know, over in IT. Yes, this guy does have conditional access. This is a legitimate request for an email profile. Let's go ahead and uh, give it to him. This sort of skips that step, makes it actually do apply logic to it and say, OK, well, we don't we do know who it is, we don't know who it is, but if, if it's enrolled and it's compliant, we're going to let this person in. So what can we use inside of Microsoft Intune in order to actually set the requirements that we're going to put in place to say that something is compliant with our conditional access policy? Well, there's actually a, a, a good list of things that we can use. So um, firstly, do we need passwords on the device? Are they going to be simple? What's the minimum length going to be? Um, what type of password is going to be required? How many characters is it going to be? Um, what sort of password quality is going to be needed, which is a um, term that we use for um, Android-based um, installations? And then how often are we going to require the device to lock out the user um, whilst they've been using it? Are they going to need any requirements around um, the password being fresh? And are we going to remember any history of that user's particular password? Do we want to prevent any kind of reuse of any of that uh, password history? And then obviously, again, if we're on, um, on iOS, just like with Office 365, if we're enabling a pin policy on the device, we're automatically going to encrypt the platform. If we're on, say, um, an Android device, then we actually have, or a Samsung Knox device, for example, we actually have to turn on the encryption policy to um, encrypt the device. If a device is um, rooted or jailbroken, then we might want to say that we don't want to allow access to any of our conditional access protected resources. And also, if we've got a, um, uh, an email account that is um, going to be managed by um, Microsoft Intune, then we need to set that up. Unlike with Office 365, we don't necessarily know with Microsoft Intune all of the details about the user's um, email profile. So we actually have the ability to set up um, an email policy which way you can actually provide all of the email details for the individual user. So you can say, this user is going to be um, using the um, SMTP address attribute from Active Directory to provide their email address. This user is going to be using this particular Exchange server. So in the case of Office 365, outlook.office365.com. In the case of your on-prem Exchange, it could be, well, anything. So we don't know that information inside of Intune. 
And then finally, we, um, we can also say whether the, um, the profile must be managed by Intune uh, in order to um, access the, the, uh, the, uh, the resources over conditional access. What's really important to notice here, though, is that there is platform ap applicability again for each one of these particular types. So in some circumstances, we can't actually pull the information off the device to be able to understand whether or not the device is compliant for that particular policy setting. So you do have to have a little bit of an idea as to um, what settings are being used where before you get to that particular point of the, um, point of the environment. Uh, so now we're going to take a look at um, configuring conditional access to Exchange Online. So in order to do that, uh, Mike, are you going to do this one or do you want me to? Go for it. I'll do it. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just going to connect into uh, the environment here. Uh, two seconds while I just go ahead and do that. Oops. And we're just going to be off of my screen while I just type my passwords in. And if you've done any policy in Intune before, this should be, as far as actually getting it done, it's it's fairly straightforward. Yeah. Um, it's not like going in and doing a lot of these custom policy type things. It's built in. It's ready to go. It's a really nice solution. As with a lot of Intune, um, if you know exactly what you want, uh, Intune's a pretty straightforward product to just get in and, and get that taken care of and apply out to the, to the uh, users that need it. So my uh, my console is just loading its very final part of the uh, of the Intune console. It'll take it a second or so while it just reruns. There we go. Okay. So we're just getting inside of the policy node right now, and uh, if we go into um, compliance policies, that's the node where we're going to see actually access to um, all of the all of the settings for um, for conditional access. They're all going to be inside of compliance policies. So I'm going to go ahead and add a new policy at this point. And it's going to give me the, uh, the details of the policy that we're going to put in place. And you're going to see this looks really kind of similar to what we see inside of Office 365, but giving us some of that platform applicability information built into the UI. So I'm going to call this um, demo policy. OK. And then let's see what we can do. So we've got all of our password requirements. And it, as again, you can see it is showing us platform applicability whereabouts are they going to be used. So here we're going to say that we need a, um, we need a password. We're not going to allow simple passwords. Um, we're going to need at least four password uh, characters. Uh, we're going to set a password expiration for 41 days. Uh, we're going to require encryption. And uh, we're not going to do anything with our email profiles. But all we need to do is check that and say whether or not it needs to be managed by Intune. So do that, save policy. And that's put conditional access policy in place. Now we need to um, actually deploy that out to some of our users. So we say yes. Then we're going to deploy that out to um, all of our users. In this case, I'm not actually going to deploy it. I don't want to change my environment. But once we've put that in place, we now have a policy that can allow access based on our resources. We then need to go and say what resources we're going to use that policy with to provide access. So I'm going to go down to my Exchange Online policy here. And we'll just give it a second or two to load up the, uh, the screen. And then we can say, OK, what are we going to do if um, apps are not compliant to our policy? We are going to block their access. And which particular groups are we going to pr provide um, conditional access to into this resource inside of the environment? So I've created a group called Windows Intune Users. And what we're going to do is require anybody in that group to have a compliant device in order to be able to get access to Exchange Online. And then a little further down, um, what are we going to do if the platform doesn't support um, providing conditional access policy? In this case, we're going to block providing access to that device. And then all I'd have to do is hit Save to move on. If I move into uh, Exchange On-Premises policy, I get exactly the same kind of thing. And again, I have the ability to do a here I have the ability to do a, um, a platform exception. So I could decide that I want to block access to um, <coughs> excuse me, any devices that are not compliant. I could then add a rule where um, I want to select that uh, this rule it will apply to everything except for um, iPad 2C5s. And we're going to 
block access specifically to iPad 2 C5 because for some reason we have a problem with that particular type of device. I can then say exactly what's going to happen at Exchange and because I have more control um, over what's happening here I can provide a very custom message um, that will be shown to, uh, to my users upon enrollment to Exchange uh, if they haven't met their conditional access policy. And then finally for SharePoint Online, this looks exactly the same as the uh, Exchange Online policy. And I can literally say, these are the um, user groups who are targeted or exempted, and uh, they have to have met the policy in order to get through. It's actually a really great discovery mechanism as well to let people know that you have an online uh, management service. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people will just go and they'll add their, their email, and now they go, oh, hey, we, you know, Let's go ahead and enroll. They enroll. They see all the line of business apps, and suddenly you have a more productive user. Yeah, it's a it is a really fabulous way of, of being able to do that. It, it helps you to to do the communication with your user base, which um, which you may not have, have been doing in the past. So um, very very helpful. Okay, so let's move to um, back through to the uh, end of this module, and uh, so we've taken a look at um, at conditional access. We've seen what it is. Um, we've taken a look at how we protect access to. Um, some of our resources and what those resources are with conditional access. We've had a look at what platforms conditional access is applicable to. We've had a look at um, the compliance policies and we've also seen um, conditional access from both the user and from the, um, uh, from the IT admin point of view inside of the environment. One of the reasons why we've got this particular section inside of a core skills jumpstart is because conditional access is such an important um, kind of capability and mindset to get into moving forward. As we start to see more resources out there um, on, if you like, the publicly accessible internet rather than inside the corporate firewall, we think we need a better solution in order to be able to manage access to those resources. So that's exactly why we're putting the, uh, the investment into conditional access and why Microsoft Intune uses conditional access to allow and provide access to corporate resources. So that brings us to the end of this module, and we're going to move into our next module in just a moment. And so starting out again now, this is module five, and uh, this is module five of the uh, Microsoft Intune Enterprise Mobility Core Skills Jumpstart. In this module, we're going to be taking a look at probably what is uh, Mike's favorite topic, uh, which is policy. We're going to be looking at, uh, at how we can manage policy on devices and what policies we can manage on a particular device. So we're going to start off by looking at uh, what the configuration service providers are inside of Windows. Um, we're using Windows, but you can also think about configuration service providers um, as being equivalent to the MDM services on, say, iOS and Android devices. We're going to have a look at how we can deploy some custom settings out to devices. We're going to look at uh, resource access profiles as well, so how we can provision things like uh, Wi-Fi VPNs. And uh, we're also going to take a look at uh, a demo of how we can run through um, resource access to profiles. So here's a big point um, that's really, really important. Uh, all devices are provisioned using the same standard written SyncML XML format. Uh, and the way you can think about that is maybe they're not using the same XML file exactly when they're going into sync, but they are all adhering to the same protocol as far as how do we go check in, when do we go check in, stuff like that. Um, and so what the key here is that these, this is built into devices uh, because obviously the trends that we're seeing is that people are bringing all kinds of devices and these devices are starting to have to up their game and have a management service sort of built into their OS versus what we had before. And Michael was talking about earlier with uh, on-prem domain machines where you're not necessarily domain joined, but you're installing the Intune client on x86 machines. Um, ARM machines specifically, non-domain joinable machines, are starting to build in a management service. In the Windows area, uh, these are configuration service providers, or CSPs. I'm going to refer to them as CSPs from here on out. They're configuration service providers. If you're familiar with the group policy area, think of these as client-side extensions. So it's the client-side part of the operating system that basically handles the payload as it comes down from the management service. 
So um, jumping right in here to some of our sample SyncML, um, really what it is, you can think of MDM, uh, at least for Windows devices, as pointing to a bunch of an XML file that points to a bunch of different um, configuration service providers. So here we've got a sample SyncML, um, and that is, this is just a simple replace command. And you can see I've highlighted in red there the actual configuration service provider. Uh, if we look through here, it's vendor, Microsoft, uh, policy manager, slash my, security, which is the CSP, and require device encryption, which is the node. And then jumping down a bit, um, one part we can highlight there is in between the format tags where we have int. That's specifying the data type. The data type itself is that red highlighted one down below. And so when, when you think about policy coming down, this is really what it is. It's a giant XML that comes down with everything that you configure through um, the portal. So when you're going and you're clicking, yes, I want a password, yes, it needs to be four, um, we want encryption, all that's doing is it's saying, uh, this CSP, one, this CSP, four, this CSP, Boolean true. Um, and so just some example of a payload here on our next slide. Uh, here's some sample XML data. It can get quite complicated. Here is a uh, configuration service provider uh, called application management with the sub uh, CSP of application restrictions. And this is how we do our um, allow and deny lists or whitelist and blacklist. If you've used AppLocker before, this should be pretty familiar. Um, <clears throat> but it probably doesn't look familiar when you're looking at it like this. So we've got here in the top line just a little bit of uh, formatting for the XML, finding the schema, and then we're actually doing a deny list. And here we can specify the app that we want to deny. We're denying the Nokia Trailers app. Um, that GUID is pretty easy to find. We've made it quite simple. If you want to block a, a GUID, a uh, app on Windows, you simply go to the Windows Phone store. This is for Windows Phone. We'll see this expanding out to um, to Windows in the future. You can see that GUID right there is simply the end of the URL in the Windows Phone Store. So if you want to deny Angry Bird, go find Angry Birds on the Windows Phone Store, find that last bit of the URL, and pop it in here. You can also deny an entire publisher. Here we're denying Microsoft, um, but say that we want to allow Facebook. Uh, that's sort of backwards. I don't know if I'd ever see this in an IT <laughs> policy. Um, and so we're denying Microsoft Corporation as that deny publisher tag implies. Uh, but then underneath that, we're going to an, uh, allow that app within that publisher. So there we have that GUID again. Um, and the publisher name, again, you can find in the store. For first party apps, so the Facebook app, you would have to go ahead and look in the, um, there's a white paper that mm -hmm. we'll show you guys later. Uh, for second party apps, so this is something that's overlooked quite often. Um, actually, not second party apps, but for your line of business apps you probably want to put your line of business apps that you've spent all this time developing in your allow list and not in your, if you're using a deny list, don't put them in. If you're using an allow list, which basically those publishers and applications are going to be allowed to run, um, you want to go ahead and put not only your um, line of business apps, which we see overlooked quite often, um, but also things like the company portal mm -hmm. is a good thing to put in there. Um, or any other line of business apps that you plan on deploying or store apps that you plan on deploying. Um, you can find it in your line of business app. If you don't know where to find it, it's in the app manifest.xml that comes in the app package. And so you might be thinking, that's great, but why do I care? Intune looks really simple to use. You just click uh, a couple drop down boxes and green sliders and we're ready to go. Um, but sometimes the settings aren't available directly in the UI. And so we use some custom settings. Um, this allows some early feature testing for a lot of our customers. If they're blocked, they can't deploy because X, Y, and Z. We can work with them directly to say, hey, you know what, this is in here. Uh, we're developing it. Let's go ahead and test it now so that you guys can at least have some verification so you're ready to make those decisions when it comes out. As Simon mentioned earlier, this can cause some problems with tattooing a device. Um, things like if you throw an allow list on a device and then you just delete the deployment, that allow list is going to stay there. Um, if you do it through the actual Intune UI, which we've added now for Windows Phone, um, it'll actually pull that back off. Um, there's some clever ways to get around that. 
So if you do have an allow list, you can just find an app that, um, you can just put a deny list on an app that you don't intend anyone uses anyways. Just find something really small in the store, send that deny list out. It overwrites the allow list. You can only have one at a time, makes sense. Um, and it'll overwrite that and the phone will come back to uh, the settings that you're sort of used to as far as allowing every app. Yeah, one of the things when you start looking through the um, uh, through the white papers and the um, the CSP and the MDM protocol specifications, is that you start to notice that there's basically three operations that you can actually um, run on a particular um, setting: an an add, a um, uh, a replace, and a get. So that literally leaves you no space to do remove. So you always will normally replace something with a blank value when you're interacting um, with things at that level. Part of the reason that we've shown you this is, A, so that you get the, the ability to understand that you can test things that are in the protocol specifications that have maybe not yet um, been in instrumented through the UI, but it also gives you that insight into what's actually happening under the hood. For everything that we do inside of the, um, the Intune UI where we're setting anything on a device, this is actually what's happening in the background. The SyncML is being created and being flowed down to that particular device to make it happen. So it gives you that ultimate kind of level of granular control. If you're a Windows admin, you could kind of think about this as, um, I guess, the ability to remake, re make remote registry edits on that particular device. That's a, a kind of a, a nice little analogy. And then you can start to think of um, kind of, I guess, group policy as being the, um, the ability to use an MDM provider in order to be able to push down those settings changes. So it's a nice way of thinking about it, a nice analogy. And we've included links on um, this particular page for um, the um, white, white papers. papers. Yeah, <laughs> and the, uh, we show the, the protocol specifications for, um, I think we've got Windows Phone and uh, Windows 10. Just we've like. got some early Windows 10 protocol out there. Um, why, the reason we write this is for, uh, the reason Microsoft <coughs> writes this is so that um, the other MDM players out there can actually write their software so that they can manage Windows devices, which is they'll need to do. Um, and so I've got a link there, and we'll go ahead and open this. Um, if you just search for Windows Phone 8.1 MDM protocol, this will show up. Um, it's quite extensive. You can see there at the top 271 pages. This goes through everything. Um, let me find just a quick, simple, I'll show you sort of what it, uh, <clears throat> oh. <laughs> uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. We'll just look at a CSP here. So you'll see it has this nice tree that sort of branches out what the options are. And um, there we go. This is Wi Fi. So Wi Fi is pretty straightforward if you're familiar with the Wi Fi schema. Basically, what you can do is run a NetSH command, um, export your Wi-Fi profile from your big Windows machine, and then put it into policy and deploy it out to other machines. Um, very, very clever the way they do that with an Intune. Um, you can also, if you want to, you can write a custom profile, a custom setting for that. It's not necessary, but I just wanted to give you guys a flavor of what this looks like. Um, you'll notice it'll tell you what's required. You don't necessarily need a proxy for your Wi-Fi profile, et cetera. And here's a nice example of uh, what you'll see. Here's some embedded XML. Um, you don't need to write your custom settings in embedded XML, and Tune will actually take care of it. Mm -hmm. um, so when you see these uh, and less than, greater than, so here's an and less than, quotes, greater than, all of this stuff, that's your embedded XML. Um, there's tools you can use to get that back out into actual less than and greater than symbols, or you can do it manually, find and replace, what have you. Um, yeah, it's, um, there's a couple of input, interesting and important things to, to kind of think about when we're doing this as well. Obviously, everything inside of the XML is plain text. <laughs> so if you're going to flow down some information which is slightly secret, so you could, for example, create a, um, and it's kind of a useful thing to do, you could create a Wi-Fi profile and have, um, say, a pre-shared key there for access to corporate Wi-Fi inside of the text file. Well, you've got to be thinking that actually that, that uh, text file is going to flow down to the device as plain text within the SSL connection that that device has back to the MDM. So 
if you're thinking about how could um, how could that be intercepted, well, if there's some way that malware had gone onto the device and they could actually read the packet from the device, then they'd be able to read access to the password, and that could be a little bit tricky. So you need to be quite careful about that, and that's actually one of the reasons why inside of um, Microsoft Intune we don't actually make it so that you can push down a, p a pre shared key um, for Wi-Fi to um, somebody's device. We make it so that you actually have to think about that and think about going down the custom XML route if it's something that you really, really want to be doing. So should we take a look at, um, at custom settings in action? Yeah, yeah, let's go ahead and demo right in. Um, we'll start off with looking at the white paper because as Simon just mentioned, some of the stuff you don't necessarily want to just go ahead and blast out to all of your BYOD users. Um, there's a nice little warning here. We're in the assigned access or kiosk mode uh, section of the white paper. And it's saying this feature should only be used on devices that are owned or provided by the enterprise company or organization or uh, on a user-owned device where they're allowing this. So basically, this is us saying, don't blast this out to devices that you don't own because this is going to be, um, this actually does require a factory reset to take off. Yep. Uh, and it's, it's pretty powerful, and, and you'll see that in just a moment. But... <clears throat> We have to actually configure it ourselves. And I'll show you what it looks like. I've actually got one that I've gone through and configured here on, let's see. I've got it right here. Here's an assigned access sample. Oh, beautiful. I love Zoom It. Works within, uh, works within RD sessions. Yeah. That's fam fantastic. So up here at the top, you can see the OMA URI uh, node that I'm specifying. So this is enterprise assigned access, um, slash assigned access, assigned access XML. And we'll go ahead and run through this, and I'll show you what you're looking at right here. So right here at the top, we've got some XML formatting stuff. First thing you're going to see is action center equals enabled equals false. Uh, or action center enabled equals false. What this does is if you're familiar with Windows Phone, this is that menu that comes down from the top. We're going to go ahead and turn that off uh, right from the get-go. Um, and then we're going to get into the meat and potatoes of this, which is your apps section. Your apps section is where we're specifying just the applications that we want to run. To give you guys, well, I'll give you guys some context in a little bit. But essentially what this is doing is it's great for a single or multiple app experience. So if you just want, uh, you know, you have one app that you want on a device, that device is going to run. Uh, maybe you're going to hand it out and give it to field workers who can go out and collect data, stuff like that. Maybe it's a point of sales device. You can have this, so that's the only app on the device. What this does is it hides everything else from the UI. And when I say everything else from the UI, I mean you will literally get a screen that just has one little tile on it, and you can't find the other stuff that's on there. Um, you do have to specify the tile size. So we have the GUID. I talked to you guys about how to find the GUID earlier. It's either in the white paper, in your app manifest XML for line of business apps, or it's um, in the Windows Phone store. You can target uh, store apps with this. And you'll notice there's a little auto run field at the end of the GUID that uh, basically lets us run an app directly on device startup, which is awesome, uh, especially for um, information workers who might get confused in the UI and stuff like that or not start the app. Uh, we've heard that before, actually. <laughs> um, and then we have tile size because we're pinning this to the start. You don't have to pin it to the start. Um, but in this case, we're pinning all three of these to the start. This first one is um, the settings application, actually. Um, very important to actually specify that that's going to be accessible on your device. Um, I'll show you why in a minute. Our location is 00. zero. The white paper has information on how to actually go and create the tiles or how to specify where they are. We've got a second app there, which is um, that one is Internet Explorer. And you can see our location is down a little bit, but we're still pinning it. And that third one is the Office Hub in Windows Phone 8.1. And that is auto run set to true, and that's going to be at the bottom of our stack. You can see we increment our Y location by two because a medium size tile is two by two. But that's all covered in the white paper. Um, button lockdown list. This is another really powerful feature if you're going to have sort of a sort of an IoT type device at this point, or an embedded handheld type device. Um, you can turn off buttons. You can not only turn off their press feature, but also their press and hold. We all know. Pressing and holding search on a Windows Phone device opens Cortana. You can turn that off. I believe we added the back button to this in later versions. 
Um, there's also a button remap list, which allows you to remap the buttons to launch. Maybe you have a line of business app that you want to launch when you hit the search button. Um, after that, we've got disable menu items, which dis disables the long press uh, to let you like change tiles and stuff like that. And then finally, settings. This allows you to um, specify only the settings that you want to come down to the device. And so here we've got Wi-Fi, about feedback, and company account, which is workplace. Um, and then we finish that off. We talk about the screen size that we want. And I'm actually going to go ahead and copy all of this. It's a little more complex than a 0 or a 1. Um, we're going to go into policy. I think I cried on the day that they added this to standalone. <laughs> this used to be a pretty complex uh, thing that you had to do through hybrid only with Configuration Manager and creating custom settings. And we've gone right here and, and put it right into the UI. It's pretty nice. And so once this is ready, I'm going to go ahead and uh, instead of switching back and forth, I'm just going to paste it all here in the description. Yes because I need to copy out this OMA URI. <coughs> oh, got a space on the end of that. We'll copy that guy out. We're going to name this Assigned Access. We're going to go, it's, this is Assigned Access. OK, so we talked about different data types. Um, the three big ones here that you're going to want to look at, actually four, string, string XML, integer, and Boolean. The difference between string and string XML being uh, is that if you have something that's configured like an XML, it's got indents and line breaks and all that stuff, you're going to want to use the XML one. If you have it in a single line, though, um, like you used to have to do with ConfigMan for custom settings for MDM, you're going to want to select string. Uh, also, some CSPs are going to be integers, some are going to be Boolean. So for this one, since it's all formatted, I'm going to go ahead and use, uh, where did I put that guy? Here he is. I'm going to go ahead and use string XML. Oh. There we go. So we'll copy that over. And we'll jump back real quick and also grab the uh, this guy here, our, our CSP, or our OMA URI. OMA URI is Open Mobile Alliance Unique Resource Identifier. It's not Open Mobile Alliance University of Rhode Island. Oh. Um, simple mistake, a common yeah. mistake. Common, common mistake, mistake. Mike. Um, and what Open Mobile, Open Mobile Alliance basically manages the protocol for SyncML, which is how all this MDM stuff talks to uh, itself and other platforms. So we're going to go ahead and hit OK. We're going to save our policy. We're going to deploy this policy to dear old, oh, I haven't added him to a, uh, we're not going to deploy this. This happens all the time. So I'm going to show you guys what you do. You're going to go over to ungroup users, find the user that you want, and add them to a collection. This is the easiest way to do it. We have Jeff. We're going to create a group from the selection. Again, I clicked on groups on the left, ungrouped users, found my user. I'm going to create a group out of the selection. He's going to be the only one in here, so I'm going to name him Jeff. That's great. A group just for one user. A group just for <coughs> one user. And you can. Um, you can set up intelligence so that when you create new users within your org, it adds them to your management groups. Yeah, that's actually a question that we um, that we had a little earlier, which was, um, what can you do to can you use um, attributes from Active Directory in order to create groups um, to be able to um, apply users to? Well, actually, yeah, you can. Um, you can um, create a group and then create a dynamic group inside of um, uh, Azure Active Directory in order to be able to use those attributes to dynamically populate the group. So it, um, it does give you exactly that solution. So you're not going in here every day, every time there's a new hire, and yeah. saying, ah, yeah, add that, this guy in. That would be really painful. And likewise, if you then have somebody that moves from, say, um, sales, and they're in a sales group, and they move from sales into marketing, 
their job title gets changed from a sales title to a marketing title, then you could have the, um, the dynamic group membership actually pick that up and move them into the right group. It's beautiful. Um, so I've gone back into policy, gone back into configuration policies, and I've found my assigned access policy again. I'm going to go ahead and select Manage Deployment, and I'm going to find Jeff. And I'm going to add Jeff, and I'm going to hit OK. And at the same time, I'm going to say, you know what? I also wanted him to have a basic mobile policy. So we'll manage that deployment, and we'll send that to Jeff. Great. So now Jeff just got basic mobile policy as well as assigned access. Um, and I've actually, I've actually cooking showed you guys. Let me go ahead. I have a device that has assigned access on it already, and I'll show you what that looks like right here. Make this guy nice and big. There we go. So this is an assigned access device. This has the same policy that I just applied. Um, I've turned it off once I got policy, and I am. Uh, it's telling me right now I need to have a password. Of course, the most secure password is just ones. <laughs> See, I always just use zeros. Yeah. Oh. Do you have to make sure they match, though? There we go. I haven't put a complexity policy or anything like that on here. Right when I enrolled too, it told me that I can't use an SD card on this device. Yeah. Um, and you've noticed this doesn't look like a Windows phone. This is Office. This device only runs Office. I don't get it. Um, we can go ahead and so because that was set as auto run in my XML, mm -hmm. when assigned access hits this device, it's going to go ahead and pop into that. It does require a reset in order to um, in order to take effect. And here we've got settings. Internet Explorer and Office. This uh, profile actually also has an email account uh, deployed to it. And here we can see that is quite streamlined. Yep, that's a pretty basic Windows phone. We can go into Settings, just the stuff we can't mess up for the most part. If you're doing testing, I do highly, highly, highly encourage you to do um, Workplace on here so that if you do need to unenroll, you can do that. And Wi-Fi and VPN, of course, in case you're putting policies on there if you need to turn VPN off. We have seen the situation where someone puts a nice VPN profile on a device, VPN profile doesn't work, and they are then stuck yeah. on that device with no internet, can't get a new policy, all that good stuff. Yeah, that's where the, uh, where the use of hard reset comes in. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we can also set, um, set other things on the device as well. That's the, we're just taking you through the, the level 3, 400 of um, being able to set policy using custom SyncML, um, which is exactly what's going to happen when we move on to this next stage behind the scenes of actually being able to deploy email, Wi-Fi, certificates, and VPN out to a particular device. Those are the company resources that we can manage access to um, through Microsoft Intune, and it will actually provision all of those settings onto the device for us, exactly like you'd expect. That's kind of, really, it's kind of standard stuff for an MDM, but Let's go ahead and, uh, and take a look at exactly um, what we're able to do there. So I'm just going to take control of the environment back from Mike again mm -hmm. so that I can take you through um, company uh, resource access uh, profiles from uh, my remote connection. So let me just go connect this back up again. OK. And we're just going to switch away whilst I enter my passwords again so that not everybody sees them. That's the best part. I know, but it's really annoying when I have to keep changing my passwords after every demo I do. And so we're back inside of uh, the Engine console, and we're back looking at configuration policies. Um, I'm going to go and create a, uh, a new configuration policy for a start. Now, the first thing we need to do is determine uh, which particular operating system we're going to be targeting. So I could go and select iOS. And say that I want to deploy a VPN profile, I'd select the IPN, iOS VPN profile. The same if I wanted to target Android, and the same if I wanted to target Windows. So what that means is if I wanted to target all three, then I'm going to have to create a separate policy for each particular platform. So you do need to bear that in mind. Uh, in this case, I'm going to target iOS, and I'm going to go and create a uh, I'm going to go and create a Wi-Fi profile in this place. But you can see that I can also do custom policy. And I could provide the SyncML um, for a, um, use for a um, iOS device um, into the custom policy here in just the same way as we just did it for Windows Phone. Um, if I wanted to provide that SyncML 
rather than using the um, Windows protocol reference for the CSP, I'd obviously be using the Apple protocol reference there, and you can find that on uh, Apple's developer site. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, configure a VPN profile, hit create policy, and again, really kind of obvious stuff, we're going to call it VPN. Um, I always like to, when I'm creating these policies, actually say um, inside of the name which particular platform I'm targeting. I kind of find it easier to understand what I'm doing a little later down the line. We then need to provide a VPN connection name for the users. And so, so VPN often works. Um, we can say which type of VPN connection we're going to use. I'm going to use Checkpoint. And what's the name of our server? It's going to be Contoso VPN again. We then need to provide the details of how to connect to the server. I'm going to provide uh, remote.contoso.com as my DNS. Uh, we can decide whether or not we want to split tunnel or not the traffic. <coughs> Excuse me. We can also decide whether or not we want to um, use certificate or username and password authentication. Notice though that username and password authentication, as I said earlier, doesn't give me the option to enter a pre-shared key here because there's no way to safely store it and pass it down to the device. So we need the user to enter it locally or for you to create your own CSP for this. And then if we go down into um, more settings here for iOS 7, we can say that it's going to be a per app VPN. And we can tie that to applications. We'll see that when we do the final section on mobile application management. We can also say whether or not, let's take that off, we can also say whether or not we want to um, use a proxy and what those proxy settings are going to be. And then we would just hit save policy and again we deploy this out to a particular group of users. Let's take a look at some of the other policies that we can set. So you can see here that I have um, an Office 365 email policy that I've put in place for iOS devices. We go take a look at what's inside that policy. It's pretty simple. The, uh, we have a name and a description. We have, a, um, we have details of the actual policy itself. So we're going to connect to the host of outlook.office365.com. We're going to give it the account name of office365.com, use those e username and email details, and we've got the um, authentication method there. Notice that whoops, for authentication methods, we can also use certificates. So if we wanted to move down that route, um, we could use certificates. We could use certificates with SMIME as well. We'd need to be integrating with the certificate infrastructure inside the organization and probably deploying the NDES connector uh, in order to be able to do that. We also have, obviously, control for email over when things are going to synchronize. I won't change that policy. I actually have it deployed. Uh, we can do the same thing for um, Android Knox as well. Um, and we have some basic policies in place for different operating systems like Android inside of this environment. I'm going to go back into my Android policies here. Um, you can see that we have the ability to um, provision Samsung Knox. Unfortunately, um, Android natively doesn't have any APIs built in to um, configure email, so we rely on being able to do that on Knox. Um, we can also do things like um, trusted certificate profiles, uh, a little bit more of a run through of what we can do in various areas. Um, we then get down into um, things like software management settings. We'll come to those a little bit later. Um, other common computer management settings on a Windows PC, which is really, this is a, a, P, a Windows PC that we're talking about these settings running on. Um, here we can control the Intune agent, and we also have the ability to control common mobile device settings, which we had a look at a little earlier on. So we have a really rich set of different um, company resource policies, really, that we can put in place in order to automatically provision access to all of these company resources when somebody uh, enrolls their device into Microsoft Intune. So I saw two different certificate policies there. You did, yeah. There was a trusted certificate policy and a SCEP certificate policy. Yep. Do you want to cover what those what the difference is? Go ahead. Okay, so basically, um, SCEP is going to be your user certs that come from Endes. We were talking about this. That is that is a pretty pretty in depth uh, experience for setting up certificate policies and stuff like that. Not something we're going to cover today. But if you do have the environment set up for it, you're going to need to make sure that you have a trusted root cert first. And then once that's deployed, you actually tell the other, the SCEP profile, which one that is. And then you can deploy additional certificates from then on. So it, is, it does require, it's a two-part process. So don't think you can just go throw SCEP on there without doing the, uh, the yeah. trust first. Yeah, you, you need to have all the, uh, all the trust up um, for that particular device you need to have deployed the right things. Um, OK, so that brings us to the end of this particular module. Um, so we've had a look at uh, some of the CSPs. In fact, I've 
frankly, a pretty deep look at the CSPs um, for Windows. And we've had a look at how we can provide custom XML out to different types of devices. Um, we've also had a look at the company resource access profiles that we provide inside of Microsoft Intune. And we've had a look um, at that, uh, both of those things using um, some of our hands-on demos so that we can see some of those things. When we get through to the hands-on lab, you will actually do your own provisioning of company resource access. So you'll be able to set up, um, for example, access to your um, Office 365 tenant inside of that lab environment. So hopefully you'll be able to take a look uh, hands-on in the next module. We're gonna take a little bit of a break right now. And uh, when we come back after that break, um, we're gonna have a look at mobile application management through Microsoft Intune. A um, few more policies in place there and we'll take a look at exactly how mobile application management um, looks to the end user on a device as well. So come back uh, just after that break and we'll take a look at that and the hands-on lab. Hey, welcome back to uh, module six of the Microsoft Intune Core Skills Jumpstart. Um, we're now going to take a look at mobile application management, or if you're English, mobile mo uh, application management. <laughs> Sorry, um, I know I'm going to take a lot of flack from people for that and the way that I started pro pronouncing that in this country, so uh, i got to just get that out of the way. What do you stick with now? Uh, I actually do mobile, mobile now. What yeah. about uh, scheduler? Uh, it's kind of tricky. I'm having to use schedule rather than schedule. Ah, yeah, okay. it's, it is tricky. Yeah, you do have to be understood. So. Um, here we go. So uh, let's uh, let's take a look at the uh, the module agenda. First up, we have um, the uh, mobile app management scenario. What are we going to be um, using there? And I'm going to take you through a demo of how this is going to appear to your end users when you implement uh, mobile application management using um, Office 365 and uh, also Microsoft Intune. We're then going to have a look at the degrees and types of application management and provide a little bit of clarity around that. There's been a few questions inside the Q&A, which I've kind of been putting off until we get to this point. And then we're going to have a look at the uh, mobile application management policy. We're going to have a look at the browser policy as well for Manage Browser. And then we're going to actually go inside the UI and can show you how we can configure application policy um, for devices. So to start us off, uh, Mike, do you want to explain what's actually going on here? Yeah, so mobile application management really is all about data separation for applications that you use for work versus applications that you have for personal use. Um, and so the idea here is that you're, you're maximizing your mobile productivity, you're protecting your corporate data. Um, this is really one of the big, big, big stories of enterprise mobility. Um, and so here we've got an iPad that is going to be managed by IT. We've got a few apps on here. And um, there we go. There we go. There's our managed apps, um, and there's our non-managed apps. So that's our that is our separation, and it's more than just separation of data: what app can access what app's data, but more so making a a uh, mental separation for the user it, through the user experience on what is actually managed um, and what is not managed. <clears throat> so there at the top, you can see some of our managed apps. And at the bottom are non-managed app, managed apps. And once we have these managed apps, we can start doing things like dictating what they can do. So if you want your email attachment to be able to copy into Excel, you can do that. If you want your email attachment not to copy into uh, Facebook or Twitter, you can also set that up. Um, you can specify which apps different things can open in. So. We've got uh, Excel, Word, there we go, where we can't paste to a personal app. We can paste to Word, but we don't want to save it to personal storage, but we do want to allow OneDrive for business. This is what we're talking about by preventing leakage of company data. So if this, um, and it's not so much of a compromised device situation, it's more of keeping the user from accidentally doing this. Um, it could be confusing with something like OneDrive where someone gets an email attachment, they say, hey, I want to save this for later so I can use it on my desktop, and they go ahead and post it to their shared with everyone folder accidentally on their public OneDrive. Mm -hmm. That could be a big, big data leak scenario um, where instead you can, they go and do that, they get a little prompt that says, hey, you can't do this, and they go, oh, yeah, that's right. This is my personal OneDrive. Let's go ahead and use OneDrive for business. Um, so it's really more about... Um, while some platforms might just do this inherently, where certain apps can't access other apps' data, this is all about the user experience 
and uh, making it pretty straightforward for the IT admin to configure a lot of this. Um, the nice thing about this as well is that it allows for a selective wipe. So you can say all of this data that lives within these managed apps is corporately owned. Let's go ahead and blow that away because the person no longer works for the company. They're no longer performing work from that device. And so we can go ahead and through the company portal or through uh, Intune, we can wipe away that corporate data within those managed apps. And it's kind of an interesting thing on this particular um, slide. When the, uh, when the marketing guys through this, uh, this slide together, um, things have kind of changed a little bit since here. So if there's an application which could be a personal application and it could be a work application within the integration that you can do with the uh, Microsoft Intune SDK, you can say basically whether or not the application is going to get wiped out or just the application's data is going to be get wiped out by that remote wipe. Because you could be in a situation where, for example, a user has paid some money for an application, the company has also paid some money for an application, and the application has basically become dual use. And then suddenly one part of the, the application, the corporate application, goes away. We don't want to wipe out the application that the user's paid for. So there needs to be some kind of um, intelligence in there to know where the data is so that we can just wipe out the corporate data in that case, which is exactly what we've managed to implement with um, Microsoft Intune. And it's really so, a capability difference, too. So you do have these smart, enlightened apps that can actually tell the difference between what data is what. And we're going to see this if you're paying attention to some of the developments with Windows 10. You're going to see this sort of direction um, on all kinds of platforms in the future. It's really, really cool. It makes it really easy for the IT admin to say, all right, all this company stuff, take it off. We're going to leave all the personal stuff, though. Yeah, it does put us into a, a really great position with this stuff. So let's take a look at um, what this is going to look like from your user experience point of view. So we're going to do a demo of uh, mobile application management for iOS. And uh, this is on my iOS device over here. Um, I'm going to go in now. And this is just the device that we enrolled earlier. So we've gone through the full enrollment process. And you can see that some of these apps have actually been pushed down to my device by the company. So as a user, I now decide that what I want to do is go into OneDrive and open up an application. So very first thing is it does is it tells me that it's managed by my company. And in this case, it's actually asking me to uh, sign back in again with my corporate credentials. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that. Hit next. <clears throat> so they're going to take me across to, uh, that's actually taking me to the wrong place. Let's try that again. It's just going to take me across to here. I'm going to type in my password as this particular user. And then because this user account has been protected with um, conditional access and with um, multi-factor authentication, it's going to ask me to um, receive a call or a text message so that I can actually move on, uh, move into the next step. So it's going to just send a text code to my mobile phone or my mobile phone, <laughs> which I'll receive in a couple of seconds' time. Uh, hopefully, normally just takes it a second or two to um, to go through. And uh, obviously, being in a uh, in a studio, it's a little bit like being inside of a uh, inside of a, a caged environment where we don't always get cell signal. So hopefully, this is uh, going to beep in a second and we'll get hold of a code. Uh, and you guys so. covered multi-factor in the previous jumpstart. Yeah. And how to set it up and all the different configurations you can do with when someone's going to get hit with multi-factor authentication and when they can just go in with their username and password. Um, super powerful tool. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, we, um, we did exactly that. We covered out how you can use um, uh, multi-factor authentication on a per-app basis in order to be able to request, require, in fact, uh, multi-factor authentication for access to some applications and not for some others. OK, my code has come in. So let's just go and enter that code. And we'll hit sign in. And that should hopefully take us into uh, our OneDrive for Business account. Here we go. So that's a good note. If you are going in and testing MFA, make sure that you set it to a phone number that you generally have use of. Mm -hmm. If you're sitting in a room with five people showing an MFA and you put it to whatever phony phone number, you'll never log in again. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, definitely something you want to make sure you know the, uh, the information for. So this, um, this uh, Installation OneDrive for Business was pushed down by the company. It's inside of my um, corporate container. So I'm going to go ahead and open up this document, document one. 
That's going to fire across into Word. So because we're inside the corporate container, we haven't prompted a second time for pin. I've already entered that. And now it gives me access into the document. It's going to open up the, uh, the Word document directly off of um, my OneDrive for Business account. So it's going to take it a couple of seconds for that to, uh, to run through. Wow, this was much faster a couple of seconds uh, ago when we tested this before we, uh, before we did this module. It's just opening up my document. I hope. And this would be the same type of experience if you're using any enlightened app on iPad. Yeah. Requiring sign-in. And that's something you can configure. Yeah, absolutely. So as soon as you sign into um, to any apps which are inside of the, um, the, co the same management policy inside of Intune, then you're actually going to just have to enter that, pass that passcode, that PIN number once, in order to get, um, to get access to the app itself. And what if someone had OneDrive installed before you went ahead and tried to push the managed OneDrive on it? Uh, well, in, actually, in that case, the app wouldn't be part of the container. We'd have to re uh, we have to have the user remove the application and then push it down again. And the only indication of that is going to be through for the IT admin inside of the Intune portal. We're not going to see it anywhere else. So as an admin, you'll have to go into the portal, see who's failing the install of the managed application, yep. and then contact them directly and say, hey, go ahead and remove this version of the app that you have, and here's why. We're going to go ahead and push a managed version due to policy. Yeah, absolutely. So. I'm just going to go in and edit this, um, edit this Word document, just like your, uh, your user normally would when they want to go in and do some things. So I'm going to go and take some um, information from it. I'm going to take this area here, and I'm going to go and copy it. And then I'm going to go back to my home screen. I'm going to go into a different application. I'll use the Pages application. And Pages isn't a managed application, so when I go in, create a new document, do a blank one, and I'll try and paste that information. You see that I can press and hold, I'll get the, the zoom bubble up here, but I don't have the ability to paste the information from the managed application, which is keeping it completely secure. Now, to do something slightly different, I'm going to come back out, back to the home screen, and go into my notes. Now, within my notes, I've made some notes while I was on the phone to a customer. I grab hold of those, that bit of information. And uh, this is obviously a non-managed application. It's just one of those applications that are built into, um, into the iPad. Then I'm going to go back into my Word document. And I'm going to see if I can paste this information in. And this time you'll see that the uh, select, cut, select Paste button appears. So we can paste and we can paste those notes in. And that's because the policy that we've deployed to this device in this case allows paste in from non-managed applications. So it allows me to have data ingress. One of the other things that we've um, configured here is the um, ability from this particular, um, from within inside of the container, that any links that we create that uh, are inside of the container will actually open up inside of the secure browser. Oh, that's interesting. OK. Or in this case, won't open inside of the secure browser. <laughs> that's kind of neat. I don't quite know how we've managed to do that. Uh, let's try and do that open again. Hmm. OK, maybe there's a little bit of a problem with that, uh, with that hyperlink there. So um, what would actually normally happen there is it would launch open the, um, the managed browser, which has also been deployed deployed by um, the company. And then we can actually specifically say which sites um, this browser can go to. And um, this allows us to say that if a link is opened and it's a corporate link, then it's always got to use this browser. We could initially say as well, it has to launch a VPN connection. And we can also say this browser can't go to certain sites. So we could say that the only sites that we can use the managed browser for, for example, are our sites which are inside of our company intranet and we need to open the VPN connection. So in this case, if I try and type in something like uh, a website that we don't want people using, like google.com, then it's going to come up and it's going to say, hey, your, uh, your administrator had blocked access to google.com. Uh, let me just go ahead and see if I can use um, a proper search engine, though. Uh, if I go and try bing.com, then we'll see that actually Bing is allowed because uh, that was the choice that we made um, as part of the policy. So let's have a think about how some of those policies come together um, by moving. Oh, actually, before we move off from this, one more thing. If I go back into Word, 
Um, I've made a couple of changes to this document. So obviously I don't get a save button inside of Word, but I can try and hit, hit the back button. And it actually will prevent me from being able to save this document in any other location other than to my OneDrive for Business. So it's going to be the only place I'm allowed to actually save my document. It actually completely removes the Save As dialog. So if we move back to our slides for a moment, let's talk um, through what we can actually configure here from a mobile application management point of view and how we set this up from an IT uh, standpoint. There's a few different degrees of management of applications. Um, in this particular case, this slide is showing you um, the degrees of management of apps for um, iOS applications. But there's one of these kind of diagrams uh, and kind of ways of thinking about this for every type of application. So moving through from the, uh, the less managed side on the left hand side across to the more managed side on the right hand side, we start off with a paid store application. When you think about it, it's really hard to deploy a paid store application. Um, somebody's got to pay for it. And in the case of most um, app stores, the user has their own credit card details added in to uh, the environment. So it's very hard for us as a corporate, um, unless that store has a VPP, a volume purchasing process in place to actually add, put a method in place to be able to pay for an application on behalf of the user. So it makes paid store applications very difficult to manage and deploy. Free store applications, however, um, we can easily deploy. So we can push an application out and have it um, install automatically on a user's device. However, the user is still going to have to consent that they want the application to install. That's a, um, uh, a platform requirement for um, most of the mobile application platforms. Then we get to the situation where you've got a custom application. You actually have the application files themselves. In this case, you can always upload them into Microsoft Intune. You can always do a push application installation down to the device, as long as the device obviously is MDM managed. But you can also take that application on, and on iOS, you can wrap it and then provide an extra level of protection, thus bringing it inside of the, um, the corporate policies that you're applying for application management. So you can then start to restrict things like cut, copy and paste, for example. The next level is the ability to SDK manage or enlighten an application. At this point, the application developers are actually building in the Intune SDK code into their application. Now, that takes a little bit more work than just taking somebody else's application and wrapping it. And then finally, there's the ability to um, build the SDK for Intune and the SDK for Azure Active Directory in using the ADAL library and that means that we can authenticate as well as just being able to provide um, those MDM controls or those application controls rather over the, um, the app. Now if we look at whereabouts we position the Office applications, so Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneDrive, they all sit in the far right hand side of the SDK managed store applications with ADA. When we start to think about um, say um, for example, I don't know, anybody else's file storage, um, cloud storage uh, application that you'll just find inside of the App Store. Right now, that's probably going to live inside of the free store app category. And then when you've got those custom line of business applications, they're either going to live in the custom um, app category or in that wrapped custom app category. So they're going to be somewhere along this, uh, this continuum. And your capabilities over what you can manage are going to depend uh, upon the exact integration route that's been taken. So if we start to think about the, um, the steps for protecting um, LOB applications, uh, <coughs> uh, we start to think about the, um, uh, the abilities to actually be able to, what do we need to have inside of that application? Well, the very first thing is we need the application itself. Uh, we almost certainly also need a, um, a certificate for the application because all of the application platforms now require that apps that are going to run on them with the exception of Win32 applications right now on Windows, actually um, have to be signed in order to be able to install them. And the signing certificate needs to be trusted by the device to which you're deploying the app. So with wrapping, we'll take those two pieces of information and then we'll wrap around and essentially redirect um, parts of the um, interaction with the device operating system out to the libraries for Microsoft Intune. We upload that package into Intune. We apply mobile application management policies to the application. 
and then we can take and deploy that application out to our end devices. Oops, go the wrong way. And then the application lands on the device itself. Now, important to point out here is you can't just take an app from the app stores and wrap it. Um, you don't actually get access to um, the right kind of information that you need in order to be able to do that from a store application. And in fact, it's actually against the, um, the store policies to um, take a, uh, an application, wrap it, and re-upload it to the public stores. Most of the public stores really don't like you to do that kind of thing. So you have to be quite careful about where you use app wrapping, where you use SDK integration, and where you actually just don't use any kind of um, application control as well. So what kind of policies can we put in place over mobile application management? So let's look at the scenario we just used. Um, in the scenario we just had, we were preventing save as. You can see some of the key players on this list. Um, and think about how they would integrate into your uh, data policy. Um, encrypting app data is going to be huge, especially on devices where the, uh, apps may be able to interact with other apps' data. Preventing save as, um, allowing app to receive data from other, other applications. So that's what we just showed you, where you can receive data, but you can't transfer data out. Um, restricting cut, copy, and paste with other apps uh, is, again, a really big one. Um, looking through the list here, you can, you can sort of build these scenarios in your head about, about what's going to work really well together. OK, so let's say that I know that I'm delivering financial data sheets to uh, my sales group or something like that. And I want them to be able to receive these files and look at them, enter input in Excel, mm -hmm. um, and then email them back out. But I don't want this to be saved in OneDrive. I don't want this to be saved in uh, Box or Dropbox or what have you. Um, you can set up preventing save as, copy and paste disable, um, just for the Excel app. So they can still go and use Word, write all the docs that they need, and send those off to their to their, um, anyone that they need to, store those in OneDrive, put them in Dropbox if they're working with a customer that uses Dropbox, stuff like that. Um, so it's super, super configurable. And then uh, jumping down to manage browser policy, um, this is, it has a lot of the same controls, but the big one here is specifying an allow or block list of sites. So if you only want intranet sites to be accessible on a device, you can do that. Um, and of course, blocking sites that you don't want your users to use, you can do that as well. So we're sort of getting away from where if someone wanted to do this before this was capable, you're thinking of all these crazy solutions with VPN tunnels and proxies and dropping traffic and that kind of stuff. Um, we're making it much more simpler for the admin to configure this so that it's a native experience for the user on their device. And again, it's only the managed apps that get this control. If you have an unmanaged app, these policies aren't going to apply. So the unmanaged browser isn't going to see any of this stuff. OK, so let's actually have a look at, um, at configuring an application policy within Microsoft Intune and uh, see where that actually takes us um, inside of the console. So I'm going to go and uh, jump back into my Intune console here. And now again, within configuration policies, um, inside of the policy workspace, we can go ahead and add a new policy. Oh, it's going to make me re-authenticate to my session. It's been a little while since we were in here. Let's do that. OK, so now we can go ahead and um, create one of these um, policies. They're within software. And we can see that we have managed browser policy for Android, managed browser policy for iOS. There is a managed browser app in both stores, and uh, you need to have the app in order to be able to manage the app with the policy. Kind of sounds a little bit silly, but you must remember that you need to go and deploy the application. Now, let's also think about um, the managed app policy. I'm going to go and create a new um, application management policy for iOS 7. Uh, let's go create a policy with the recommended. Let's go and create a custom policy, actually, to be able to go through more detail. So we'll call it test. Uh, test man policy will do, just to make things easy for me typing. OK, then the very first thing is, what are we going to do with the web content that's going to appear with inside this application? So if the application needs to open a web browser, where's that information going to go? We can say here that we want to um, restrict content only to the managed browser. If we say no, then it, everything is going to open up in um, on an iOS device, the default browser, most likely Safari. If we say yes, everything is going to need to 
open up inside of the managed browser. And if the managed browser isn't deployed, then they won't be able to open up um, those links. If we move into document relocation, um, we can see whether we're allowed to um, back up information into um, iOS, into um, iCloud or iTunes there. Uh, we can also see um, where we're allowed to um, transfer application data to. If we select um, any app, that literally means that the data can go to any application on the device. If we select policy managed apps, what it means is it's only going to be able to transfer application data, um, sorry, transfer data to other applications that are managed by this policy. And that's really important because you can have multiple um, application management policies for the same platform but the application management policy is essentially what groups all of those applications together. We can then say, are we going to allow the data to receive application from other applications? So this essentially is saying, are we going to um, allow uh, managed open in to allow the user to open an, this application up? If we say any app, then this information can have data ingress from any application. Managed policy applications segregates our applications even further so that they can only be opened um, inside of by apps that are already inside of our policy. We prevent save as, then obviously we're going to stop the save as screen from appearing inside of applications. Um, if we restrict cough, copy and plate, we have a few options. Firstly, we can stop cop, copy, cop, yeah, cut, copy and paste from being used at all, or we can say that um, we can only um, cut, copy and paste between apps that this policy applies to, or we can say that we can only cut, copy and paste between apps that this policy applies to and other applications that we want to allow this policy to be pasted into from. Uh, then when we get down to pin access, we can say that a pin's required, pin reset numbers. And we can also require that the application prompts for corporate credential access every time um, that we launch the application. So that could be, become quite cumbersome for people. It might be um, better to have a pin in place for access and argumentatively actually having a pin can be more secure than uh, requiring the corporate resource, uh, the corporate credentials every time. The next setting gives us the ability to um, check that a, um, div, uh, that a device is compliant with the corporate policy for access. So if we say yes here we're essentially putting conditional access in place um, with this policy above for this particular application. And then we can say how often the application itself has to check that the access policy is still valid before it'll allow somebody access to the application. So that whole idea and the notion of conditional access is brought right down to the level of can I even launch the applications in the first place on the device. And then we get to say when we're going to bother to actually um, start encrypting the data. Um, when the device is locked is probably one of the best options on an iOS device, um, but there's a bunch of other settings we can use if we want to. Once we've taken that policy, what we actually do, and I'm going to go and grab my um, managed application policy down here for iOS, wherever I've put it, uh, managed browser, corporate iOS app policy, there it is. I'm going to edit this. You'll see that I've actually gone and deployed this um, out to, uh, actually, let me go back here. This is going to be a little bit of a better way of doing this. Let's create that new policy for iOS. Um, let's go in and go into uh, iOS whoops, software. Let's go into our application management policy. We'll create a policy with the recommended settings, which is just going to give us a basic policy. We'll then go and whoops, manage its deployment. Okay, that's kind of strange. I can't click its managed deployment. Um, it's not associated with the applications that it's managing. Aha, okay. Let's edit the policy. Ah, of course. Okay, good point. Thank you for that. So now that I've got my, um, my policy that I've just created, what I actually need to do is go into my applications and associate that policy with the applications. So I'm going to go to the apps pivot just here. I'm going to apps. And you can see that I've already added a whole load of applications. But let's go ahead and add a new app. I'm going to go add app. And I'm going to add a version of the, um, the OneDrive for Business app. I'm going to hit Run. It's going to just download the software installer, software publisher rather. OK, 
couple of seconds and then they okay it's going to ask me to sign in again as the uh, ad software wizard does every single time you're going to do this um, through the lab in a few moments time as well add in admin at Okay, so now that we're signed into the add software wizard, it's gonna give me the, uh, the ability to add some software into my Microsoft Intune tenant. There we go. I'm gonna say that this is gonna be a managed iOS application from the App Store. I specify the URL now. Now I need to get the URL for the OneDrive application from the App Store. Easiest way I find to do this is to just go and search for it. So if I try OneDrive uh, iOS app, I should try that. So that's probably going to find the uh, the OneDrive for um, iOS application on the App Store. All I need to do is go and grab hold of the um, shortcut for it. So let's uh, copy shortcut. Go back into the browser and paste in the URL for the application in the App Store. We'll say next. Provide a name. Uh, new OneDrive. Let's uh, just use the same details to move through this, but obviously this is information that your users might see, so you're going to want to add good quality information in here generally. You can select which particular platforms, iPad or iPad, uh, iPhone, you're going to deploy this to. We'll say next. And we're going to do upload, which will happen super quickly because there's nothing to upload. We'll say close. We go back into Microsoft Intune. Um, I'm just going to need to refresh this. I find the easiest way to refresh is just to click back to detected software and then back into apps again. We'll see that we have our new OneDrive application just here. And that's the one that we just added. So now I'm going to go do manage deployment. <coughs> and I now get the, the ability to go and say who are we going to deploy this to? Well, we're going to target Jeff in this case. He seems like a likely target. We'll say next. He stands out. He does. He's just there. He's got his own group. <laughs> then we're going to say that this is a required installation. We could make it available, which would just show it up in the company portal, but we're going to say required. I then get to provide which particular application management policy we're going to apply. So in this case, I'm going to use my new policy that I just created. So this will now be in a separate container in effect to all of the other applications that I've deployed. And we can only require it install enlightened applications? Uh, we can only require it required install free applications in the Apple Store right, right now. Right. Um, then we can provide a VPN policy, or a VPN profile. So we can actually set this application up to require a specific per app VPN. We're not going to do that. Let me hit finish. And that's how we go from the pr process of creating a um, mobile application management policy getting an application, taking the application and deploying it to the user. I've also done that with um, some other applications here. So <coughs> for example, we deployed uh, the OneDrive for iOS application. And if we have a look at the properties of this app, we'll see something very important. We'll see that once we've added that application, we know that it's going to support application policy because it literally says that it supports app policy. So once we um, go off and we suck the information in from the uh, from the App Store, we actually understand that the app supports policy. And here we can see that this application had um, an installation failure um, on one particular device. We're going to have a quick look at the, uh, the details of that failure. We can see that that was um, when we enrolled earlier, the iPad, the, I, the OneDrive application was already installed. So this is telling me now that I need to go and talk to Laurie and say, hey, you need to uninstall your previous OneDrive application so that we can corporate manage it. So. And it's not like it's a separate app in the store. It's the same app. It's just where the source is from. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you won't, you won't go look and find the managed Outlook app versus the regular Outlook app necessarily. Completely. Yeah, they are just one um, app inside of the store. Now, that's kind of unusual. If you look at the other um, MDMs out there, you'll actually find that those other EMM platforms actually have um, a specific version of the application for their platform, which... Um, it's not kind of the way we're going at the moment. And sometimes so, that's the entire MDM solution is a yeah. a rich app, and then you deny the other apps that don't have those management. And a lot of the feedback we get is that they're maybe not written so well. They don't 
They're not as quick. They're not as fast. Yeah. But it is an answer for uh, containerization. It is. And the, um, the, one of the major advantages of the Office applications is that they are um, the highest rated productivity applications <laughs> in all of the app stores. So that's a kind of useful thing. Um, if we have a quick look at this Manage Browser policy as well, we will see that the, uh, the browser policy is one that we've deployed out to um, some of our users already. You can see here that we're blocking access to a specific um, group of URLs. And you can see that we have a wildcard in there in order to be able to do that. Um, but we could allow access to just those URLs. And that will put a um, allow list in place where we could only access um, things that end in .google.com. So I'm going to put that back to um, manage browser and hit cancel at this point. And then in exactly the same way as we deployed the, um, uh, the application management policy, that's how we deploy the uh, manage browser policy. So if I go back into apps, I'll go down into my apps, we'll see that I have my manage browsers in here for iOS. Uh, where is it? Up, it's up, 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 up. There it is. Go into its policy settings. Uh, sorry, let's go back. From, let's go into its deployment settings, either, even. And we'll see from in here we have a manage browser policy which is actually applied to that particular group. So now, whenever that particular user is, that this particular application is going to be used, it's going to be part of the corporate iOS application policy policy and it's going to have the Manage Browser policy applied to it as well. So that takes us through being able to do um, application management, mobile application management inside of uh, Microsoft Intune. That is some cool stuff. It's, uh, yeah, it's really, um, it's really getting there and really growing as well. As, uh, as more apps come uh, on board into the ecosystem, we should start to see um, a lot more functionality inside of there as well. So. A um, couple of uh, useful things to be able to go and see. There's a full policy resource on all of the policy settings that can be applied to um, the application management policy and the managed browser policy. So go ahead, take a look at those on TechNet, and I'll make sure that they form part of the blog post that we use to follow up a little later on as well. Um, we've reached the end of this module, and uh, let's uh, so let's just talk about we, uh, what we went through. We went through uh, mobile application management, why you might use it, what it's going to look like for the end user. We talked about the different types of mobile application management inside of Microsoft Intune. We also had a look at the um, Manage Browser policy and the way that we can apply that policy to our devices. And we had a look at the um, ability to actually do that within the Microsoft Intune console. So hopefully that's given you a load of the core skills that you need around building uh, application management policies inside of uh, Microsoft Intune. And hopefully, we've given you a load of the core skills that you need in other areas as well. So now, what we're going to do is move into um, probably a very quick break and then roll into our um, section on the virtual instructor-led lab. I'd like to thank Mike for uh, coming along thank and uh, sharing his knowledge with us yeah. um, around uh, everything to do with this. I'm going to take you through the virtual instructor-led lab uh, in just a moment's time. Hello and welcome back to this, the final module, where we're going to start having a look at our virtual instructor-led lab, which gives you guys the chance to get hands-on with Microsoft Intune and actually do some of the config of some of the components that we've talked about throughout the entire jumpstart. Just before we get going, though, just a couple of little tips. I'm going to be going through this at a reasonable speed, reasonable pace. I'm going to do everything live, so we might see the occasional progress bar. And that's really cool because that's when things are happening. You're going to see stuff happen in the lab environment at roughly the same kind of time. So just be aware of that. Firstly, before we get there, you're going to go and need to launch the lab. And you'll find that link inside of the Microsoft Virtual Academy page where you're viewing this video. Keep the video going at the same time as having the lab up so that you can hear me. That's pretty useful when we're doing an instructor-led lab. And also, as we're going through, there might be times where there's just a little bit of pause and time to catch up, and you might find that your environment is not quite as quick as the environment that I'm running in. So they are exactly the same, but things sometimes get a little bit laggy out there on the internet. What you should try and do right now as I'm talking is actually start that lab up, start connecting, start trying to get everything up and running and working. Some folks might need to go through a quick reboot in order to get the lab up and running. That's okay, just reboot, come back into Microsoft Virtual Academy and get back onto the stream. 
And honestly, if it all goes horribly wrong for you, don't worry. Just come back and do the lab at any time. The labs can be done independently of this Microsoft Virtual Academy Jumpstart. So you've got plenty of time to do that if you start to get a little bit stuck. And speaking of getting a little bit stuck, if you do, just ask questions on the Q&A and we'll try and help you out and get your problems fixed as quickly as we can. We might not be able to help out every single individual case, but if we start to see the same thing coming up time after time, then of course we're going to answer that publicly so that everybody gets to take advantage of it. Okay, all of that said, let's make a start and get into the virtual instructor-led lab. I'm going to switch across to my machine right now and I'm going to start taking a quick look at the lab environment. And the very first thing that we're going to do is go and sign up for a trial tenant for Microsoft Intune. So here I am inside of my Windows Server environment and I'm going into Internet Explorer and just typing in the URL aka ms slash try Intune. And once we get there, you can see that I'm going to hit the Microsoft Intune product website. And then I'm going to go through to the Try Now link. And I'm going to fill out the form with all of my details. So first thing, my country and region. Obviously, I'm going to select the United States, but you can select wherever it is that you're connecting in from. I'm going to leave organization languages English. I'm going to put my details in, my name. I'm going to provide an organization name. I suggest you use some kind of variation on your company name. Don't use your actual company name. That could just cause you some problems later down the line. Also pop in your address and your zip or postal code. Provide a phone number. We've blurred my phone number on this screen here just so that I don't get too many calls. And then I'm going to pop in my email address. And that's a very useful thing. That email address is going to be used if we need to do any password resets. So make sure it's a live valid email address. And then I'm going to type in something meaningful for my new company domain name. So I'm going to call it Jumpstart ILL. I'm going to do a check of availability. And then very quickly the tool is going to come back and tell me that it's OK. It's good. And I'm then going to create an administrative username. In this case, I'm going to type in admin. It's kind of easy to remember. And I'm going to create a password, which is going to be strong, at least eight characters. And it is case sensitive, obviously. Scroll down a bit. OK, then I'm going to verify that I'm a human being by entering this code. I am actually human, as strange as it may seem. Just concentrate. And I'm going to accept and continue. Now that's going to go and create the tenant for me. One of the cool things is that because we run Microsoft Intune as a real cloud service, there is no real waiting for me to get this tenant set up. We don't have to get some little mice off running, setting up physical servers for us inside of some weird data center. We just deploy everything automatically for you inside of Microsoft Azure and inside of the Microsoft Cloud. So hopefully it's not going to take me too long. OK, you should be seeing roughly the same performance, but you might find that things are running a little slower for you. OK, I would normally want to fill out this don't lose access to your account page, but in this case, I'm going to hit remind me later. It'll keep reminding me to uh, have an alternative authentication option. Now that we're done, let's get out of Internet Explorer for a second. and I'm going to move across to my Contoso BYOD machine. Here I'm going to sign in with my administrator account. The password is password, P-A-S-S-W-0-O-R-D, which is located inside of the lab manual, which you're seeing on screen as well. Now that we're in here, let's go ahead and jump back into Internet Explorer again. And this time I'm going to go to manage.microsoft.com, which is the main Intune portal. I'm going to sign in with the admin credentials that I created just a couple of moments ago. And then we're going to take a bit of a tour in these first few exercises through Microsoft Intune itself.
Okay, that looks like the portal has uh, has loaded up for me. So let's go and start to uh, to explore things inside of the portal. Just giving folks a, a few couple of extra seconds here so that you can catch up a little bit. Okay, we're going to go down into the admin portal. Hopefully that was a nice long pause to give you guys some time to, uh, to catch up with me there while I was just reading some notes. Um, we're then going to go into view the service status. Now this is going to show me um, that the uh, service incident is running normally, um, or if there's any problems anywhere in the world, it's going to tell me that there's some issues. So if your users are reporting some kind of issue to you with Microsoft Intune, then this is where you can go and find out exactly what's happening. We're now going to go ahead and we're going to go into alerts and notifications and just have a quick look at some of the alert types that we can actually start receiving as an administrator. You can see that we're actually pulling in lots of information here. We can see that we're detecting duplicate IP addresses inside of the machines that we're managing inside of this tenant. You can see that we're also pulling in information around our cloud storage not having enough space but it's telling us lots and lots of rich stuff. If I go into recipients, you can see who's gonna receive those uh, notifications. And if we go into notification rules, we'll see when people are gonna receive notifications about things inside of Microsoft Intune. Let's go ahead and look at the service administrators first. These are um, the administrator accounts that can actually manage our Microsoft Intune service. Our tenant administrators are the administrators who can manage parts of the tenant itself. So this is where you can start to delegate control of Microsoft Intune out to some of the other admins inside of your organization. And you can see here that uh, at the moment the um, admin at Jumpstart ILL, the one that you've created, is actually a tenant administrator. And then device enrollment administrators are accounts that can enroll more than five devices so you can use these to do bulk enrollment of devices into Microsoft Intune. So a very, very useful group of users that are very special inside of Microsoft Intune. Now, if we want to be able to manage um, Windows PCs, we can go ahead and download the client software. That allows us to do management beyond what we can just do with the OMA DM, the mobile device management capabilities of Windows. Inside of the company portal pivot, we can actually go and change some of the details that appear in the company portal, like the company name. We can change the contact details inside of the IT department. However, one of the main things that we want to do with Microsoft Intune is enable mobile device management. So let's go into the mobile device management tab and take a quick look at what's in here. The very first thing that we're going to be wanting to do within mobile device management is to set the mobile device management authority. So we'll tick this box. And that's actually saying that we weren't going to be using Microsoft Intune as the MDM authority. The alternative is to use this in conjunction with Configman, and Configman will then manage Microsoft Intune for us. So now that we've done that, we need to actually set up the management settings for each particular type of device. Let's go ahead and do Windows first. For Windows, for Windows 8.1, we're going to enter the details of sideloading keys if we want to be able to sideload applications outside of the Microsoft Store. And in order to be able to do that, we need sideloading keys for those particular devices under certain circumstances, such as when they're not using uh, Windows 8.1 Enterprise. A 
course, we also need access to the Apex files in order to be able to deliver them as well. So as you can see here, I'm just going to enter some details and as you're following along inside of the lab guide, you're going to be entering a couple of fake keys just to see what happens and what works and how they actually go ahead and get attached. Okay, it looks like I'm just having a few issues getting the product key format right here. Uh, it's not actually getting there. Not quite sure why. Hmm, that's a little bit strange. That should be going through. Uh, let's just check that I've got these right. Let's try a different code. Okay, let's try changing this to all zeros. Okay, I thought that was gonna work, let's move on. Let's not worry about it. We're not gonna need those for the rest of the exercises that we do. The next thing, if you're gonna be deploying Apex files is to be deploying the certificate that was used in order to sign the Apex files. We need to sign applications that don't go through the Windows Store. So let's go ahead and find the certificate for my application. It's on DC sources dollar and it's inside of the sample apps folder. You'll find it called tilesample.sir. We'll do upload and the code signing certificate has successfully uploaded. Hopefully yours did too and you're following along quite happily with this. Okay so that's what we need to do in order to be able to manage Windows devices using the OMADM capability, the MDM capabilities of Windows 8 and Windows 8.1. What about Windows Phone management? Well, here there's a couple of things that we need to do. Step one, obviously, is to make sure that DNS is working properly, but we're gonna use our own Microsoft.com details. So I'm gonna to go to Evaluating Company Portal resource on the right-hand side, and that's gonna allow me to go and download the Company Portal application from the Download Center. So I hit Download. And that's just gonna go ahead and do that, pull it down. Let's hit run, might as well run it. And this is actually gonna allow us to create a customized version of the company portal if we wanted to, but then use the company portal to be deployed out to our devices. Say next and agree, and next again. And do just me here, and next. Okay, and then we'll install. As I said right at the beginning, there's gonna be a few cases where we're gonna get a few little progress bars appearing. Um, just gonna let those run through in real time. Let's click yes on the user account control. And hopefully uh, they just give you a couple of opportunities to catch back up if you're running a little bit behind. Okay, I'm gonna hit close on this then. There we go. And uh, let's go back to my Intune portal as well. I've got no more need for the download center. Okay, so moving on to step three, we've got the, uh, the company portal app downloaded. Let's go and upload our signed application. The one that we download as a trial is actually already signed with a certificate that will be trusted by Windows Phone, which is great. So let's go ahead and upload our signed application. Now it's gonna start the Intune software publisher. We're gonna see this a few times a little bit later on inside of the lab. But the Intune software publisher is basically the tool that allows us to take a piece of software, take the application binaries and upload them into our storage inside of Microsoft Azure. So once that runs, it's gonna start off a, uh, a click once application to add the software. It's gonna ask me to authenticate. So I'm gonna type in my admin at jumpstart.ill and you'll notice that it's actually um, already got some details there for me because of the power of uh, caching inside of Internet Explorer. Pretty cool. Let's go and sign in. Oh, I actually do need to, uh, to click the button, that helps. And now that we've signed in, okay. We obviously get the, uh, the welcome screen for the wizard. We're gonna hit next here. 
I move on to the second step. So this time we're going to select that uh, we're going to be uploading a um, uh, what are we going to do? Ah, that's it. We're going to go and select that we are going to browse for um, for the file. So let's go and locate the installation location, which will be in program files x86, and that's going to be in there it is called whereabouts is it microsoft and it's inside of support tool for windows intune it's in the ssp self-service portal zap file there we go it's found it let's uh, hit next it knows that we're uploading a company portal at this point it automatically detected that let's type in some details here the publisher details we're going to see these inside of the intune console in a little while let's give it a new name company portal And one of the things that I like to do when I'm uploading applications is always to say what the platform is that the application is for. Because that's not something that's instantly, uh, instantly visible to you through the Intune console. And a quick copy and paste into the description. So let's put it inside of our computer management apps. Say next and upload. You'll have noticed that previously there I could have actually uploaded an application icon as well if I'd have liked to. Um, inside of this lab, just to get us through it expediently. We won't bother, let's hit close. And there we go, we've now got the ability to support uh, Windows Phone devices through uh, mobile device management. So let's move on, let's go and set up iOS devices. Now in the case of setting up iOS devices, what we actually need to do here is have a certificate exchange with Apple with, so that we can make use of the Apple push notification network. So we'll first go and turn on uh, the capability to manage iOS devices. And now we need to go and download the uh, APN, the Apple Push Notification Network certificate request. So let's go ahead and download the certificate request. I'm going to download it as a CSR file. I'm going to call it cert request. And once we've got that, I'm going to go across to uh, the Apple website. I'm just going to fire up my Apple browser by clicking on this, and it's going to take me to the Apple push notification certificate. Now, it's asking me for um, an Apple ID. You can use any Apple ID that you've already got in order to do this. So if you have an iOS device, that will be your sign-on details. And then we'll click the sign in button just here. Okay, now you can see I've done this more than once before. So you can see that I've got lots of expired certificates from uh, early in 2014 and 2015. So let's go ahead and uh, just read all of the uh, nice legal information and hit accept. Okay, now I'm going to provide some notes just so that I can track my certificate again inside of the Apple push notification portal. And then we'll download the uh, signing request, sorry, upload the signing request. And we'll hit the upload button. Now this is where things go a little bit strange inside of Internet Explorer and we get this JSON file being pushed down to us. I'm just going to hit cancel. Just check that I'm doing the right thing there inside of the instructions. Yeah, I'm going to hit cancel. And then let's go back to the previous screen of uh, the Apple Push Certificates portal. And you see that it's going to just sit in the, uh, the uploading status there for quite some time. Um, that's because the page is actually built for Safari. And then once we get in, you'll see that right down at the bottom here, we'll have our uh, most recent certificate. The most recent certificate is always listed at the bottom of uh, all of the other certificate requests, if you've had any other certificate requests in the past. I'm going to go ahead and download it and save. And having done that, we've now got hold of the PEM file. Let's go back to Intune. Okay, my session's timed out. Let's re-authenticate. You might get the same thing. You might not. Depends how quick you were. And now I can upload that certificate. So let's go ahead and find the certificate. Just browse to the location I've downloaded it in my downloads by default. And it's also going to want the Apple ID, which again, we've blurred my Apple ID so that not everybody can sign into my iCloud. I'm going to hit upload. And that's it. We can now enroll and manage iOS devices inside of our Microsoft Intune environment. So we now have Microsoft Intune set up to manage basically 
every platform that we could possibly manage through Microsoft Intune. We can manage iOS, we can manage Windows, Windows Phone, and we can manage Android because there is no extra setup in order to make Android devices trust Microsoft Intune. They just trust any management system by default. So let's move back and have a quick look at something else. And let's go and have a look at the company portal in a bit more detail. Let's go and fill out a few of the extra details here so that we can see where they're going to appear later on. You might want to fill out all these details so that your users can actually navigate the company portal and have trust in it. And they really know that the company portal that they've installed is and they're connected to is the company portal for your organization. Kind of a, uh, a pretty core requirement really when you're going to be taking policy from it and uh, downloading um, applications from that. So let's provide phone numbers, email address. Uh, let's whack a little bit of uh, extra information there. We can provide a company privacy statement URL, which you can use to say, hey, this is how we're going to treat your data as a user, and this is what we're going to be able to do on your device. And then you can provide the details of uh, exactly where inside of your company they can get support. So if you've got a help desk website, anything like that, those details can go in here. And in this case, uh, we're going to say that that's going to be our um, support website. And we can call it Contoso IT Support. And I'm going to say save. Okay, that's made all of those changes put in place. We can also set specific terms and conditions so that when people enroll their device into the company portal, they're going to have to accept specific terms and conditions before they can use the company portal. You really might want to be doing this to make it completely clear to people that you will have the capability to, say, enforce passwords, to be able to remotely wipe their device, for example. Anything that causes you a bit of concern, you're going to want to work with your HR and legal departments in order to build really good wording into this particular part of the, uh, part of the process. And you can also, uh, so we give you one box for putting in all the legalese, and then you can have another box for actually putting it in plain English so that people can understand uh, what they're going to be doing. And then I'm just going to hit save, and that saves that particular part. Okay, let's go ahead and look at the, uh, the next part of this lab. Type in account.manage.microsoft.com because we're going to create a couple of user accounts in order to be able to manage our users. And so we're going to create some users to manage. Now, we also have account.manage.microsoft.com as part of Microsoft Intune, which allows us to manage users, to manage security groups and domains and licenses and all this kind of stuff. So I'm going to go into users and I'm now going to go and create a new user. So I'm going to find the new users link. And we're going to set somebody up. Let's get the details in the document of who we're setting up here. Okay, so new user, add user. And let's type in a new username. I'm going to type in Laurie and a last name as well. Can a display name and a username. And then click next. So what I've actually done here is we've just created, uh, say, uh, let's say this right, say, that we're going to be in the United States, and I'll click next. So we've just created a standalone cloud user, and we've also licensed them just there to Microsoft Intune. And I'm going to send myself the uh, temporary password so that I know who they are. So we've just created a user inside of our tenant. Now, in a production situation, you're probably going to use Azure Active Directory Sync in order to synchronize those details from on-premises. And if you want to know how to do that, go and have a look at the jump start that we did on Azure Active Directory just a month ago. That is now live and available on demand. So as soon as you're done here, you can go and binge on watching as much Microsoft Virtual Academy as you possibly can. So now that we've got that, I'm gonna make a note of the temporary password and hit finish. Bobber 4418, must remember that, okay. And let's get rid of the account portal.
Okay, I'll give you guys a couple of uh, extra seconds here to catch up while I read my notes just to make sure what I'm doing. Okay, right. Let's go uh, back into the office portal this time. So portal.office.com. And it's going to ask me, hey, don't lose your account. I'm going to hit uh, enter my mobile phone number here. Okay, now that I'm inside the portal, let's go and uh, just make sure that we've licensed that new user. You'll notice that I didn't actually have to do anything there. My, um, uh, my office, I was able to sign into the Office 365 portal straight away. So let's just see what I need to do next. Let me go to my... Admin, let's go back to admin home. There we go. Make sure I'm in the right place. Yes, I am. Ah, okay. So we aren't subscribed to any services at this point, so I must need, must need to remember exactly what I'm doing here. Uh, let's go to active users. Ah, okay, yeah, I've missed that. Let me, uh, let's make sure, I think the, uh, the, the, you'll find this in the notes as well, so we'll go to AKMS slash Office 365 E3 USA, or U E3 Trial US, in fact. Okay, there we go. Okay, so it's automatically detected that I'm already signed in, uh, and I might want to add an E3 trial to my account, so I'm gonna say yes, add it to my account. actually go click the button and add that into my account so what you're actually going to see here is how well connected together your Microsoft Intune experience is and your Office 365 experience is because we're going to take that one cloud user that we created from inside Microsoft Intune she's already available inside of um, Azure AD and therefore automatically inside of Office 365 as well since both look to Azure AD let me go and hit uh, try now to confirm the order and then continue now that we've got a receipt. You can see we've got a 25 user 30 day subscription trial. And great, okay, back into the portal. That was exactly what I was expecting to see the last time. I've now got service health in there, which is pretty cool, showing me that everything inside of my environment is running nice and happily. Okay. So, I'll just give you guys a couple of extra seconds here before I move into the very next thing to uh, to keep this going. Okay, this one was actually back in the right place, so I'm going to use that. So I'm now going to go down, select my uh, my Lorry account that I created earlier. Let's go and assign her a license by clicking Edit. Let's tick the Office 365 E3 plan and hit Save. And that's going to set her up with everything she needs inside of Office 365. So she's going to get SharePoint, she's going to get Yammer, she's going to get Link, but very importantly, she's going to get a Microsoft Exchange email box, which is exactly what I need for a couple of steps later on, which is why we went into Office 365 to enable the user. So she is now completely mail enabled. I'm just checking, yeah, let's go back into there. Okay, so I'm gonna go and uh, run into the portal and let's go and set up a few more things inside of Intune. So I'm gonna keep slowing down like this every so often to give you a chance. So I'm gonna go into, uh, I'm gonna go into groups. Give it a second to refresh. 
and ungroup users. And we're gonna create a group called sales, which is gonna have all of our users in there from, from sales, in this case, Laurie, the account we created earlier. So there's Laurie, and we're gonna create a group from selection. So I'll go and hit create group from selection. There we go. And we'll give it a new name, let's call it sales. Hit next. Uh, it's gonna be uh, an empty group. And we'll hit next. Obviously it's gonna contain Laurie who's being added in directly. There we go, specifically defined direct memberships. And then we'll hit finish. So we now have a direct membership group that we can use for targeting for policies and applications. Okay, let's go and uh, let's go and actually create the apps now that we're going to uh, allow people to um, have access to and that we're going to deploy inside of our organization. So I would have things inside of detected software if I had the Intune client installed and some of those devices had, devices had inventoried and passed information back to Microsoft Intune. If I go into apps though, I can actually add new apps out there that are inside of the stores or that are uh, that I have the installation files for and go and deploy them. So I'm going to say add app and this time what we're going to do is we're going to find that the uh, software installer opens, software publisher, use the same cache credentials again and sign back in. And we're going to hit next and this time I'm going to say a external link and I'm gonna go and search for um, the Skype for iPad application inside of the browser. Now, this is I find this to be the easiest way to get hold of these particular links, and it's easier than typing them in uh, as they are in the uh, lab manual. So I've just copied the link, I'm gonna paste it in there. Now, the publisher knows that that's an application from the Apple Store, so as soon as I enter these details, we're gonna complete the information. I need to provide a description, I always just copy and paste in a lab a lot easier then hit next and it now knows that it's a, an iPad application so we're going to select iPad and uh, uh, rather iPhone for this one and we're going to hit upload there is no files to upload they obviously serve directly from the Apple Store I go back to detected software and back to apps and you can see that uh, Skype for iPhone is now listed I'm going to add another application which in this case is Skype for Android so again I'm going to provide my creds inside of add software Get signed in. Don't know why, but I find that uh, sign in button really tricky to, to actually click on. Okay, then we're going to say next again on the welcome screen. Again, we're going to use an external link. And then I'm going to go back to my search and I'm going to type in uh, Skype for Android. There we go. And this time, one of these links is going to be in the Google Play Store. Uh, where are we? Here we go. Yeah, that's it. So let's go grab that link that URL and back into the application, pop it in, hit next and we're going to type in uh, the publisher again is Microsoft, the name of the application is Skype and I'm going to use Skype for Android. As I say I like to put the, uh, the name into uh, the name of the uh, platform that it's being targeted to into the name and then into some details into the description, same group again, next and upload, again really quick. And then let's go ahead and do exactly the same thing, but this time we're going to add the application for Windows Phone. So next, so external link. And again, let's go back, let's go into my query here on Bing, and I'm going to type in Windows Phone. Now one of the things about the Windows Phone Store is that the URLs are really, really long because we use GUIDs at the end. So in this case, I'm going to have to actually go directly into the store, 
and then I'm just going to grab the URL from the address bar, copy and paste it into my specify URL, hit next, again name, Microsoft, again the name of the application, Skype for Windows Phone, and finally a description, again copy and paste the name, and we're going to pop it into collaboration and social, hit next and upload. And we're done. So we've now got Skype provisioned for all platforms, just about, we haven't done Windows actually, inside of um, the apps portal, all as applications that somebody could go and get from inside of our company portal. Now, as we were going through that, you'll have noticed that there was another option, which is to add a managed iOS application. Managed iOS applications are a bit special because I can use those to push the installation out to an iOS device if it's a free app inside of the uh, Apple App Store and I can also use it in order to be able to um, containerize it a little bit inside of our uh, MAM, our mobile application management uh, policies. So I'm now going to deploy to the sales group. Uh, so I'm going to deploy, add sales. And now you can see that I can only set this type of installation as available. That's because there isn't actually a way to push an application out to, a native, to an Android device natively using the SDKs. I'm going to do this again and repeat for each type of platform because I need to deploy them all out to my user. What I'm trying to do is make it so that it doesn't matter what type of device my users are actually using, they're going to be able to get the applications that I'm intending that they have access to. And the ones that I really want to curate for them and therefore recommend as the apps that they should be running. Okay, so that's it. We've deployed the app to, uh, to everywhere it needs to go. Great. So now what? So that's... That's what we do with, uh, with application deployment. That's how we can deploy apps out to basically any type of operating system. And uh, let's go and now have a look at our policy. So we're gonna create a couple of different types of policy here in order to be able to push settings and configuration down to our mobile devices. So I'm gonna go to add policy. And for this first one, I'm gonna select a, what am I gonna select? Where am I in the instructions? I'm going to select an Android policy. So let's just go and have a quick look at all the ones I can add. I can add Android policies, configure specific email configuration for Knox, for example. I can add iOS policies, email, VPNs. I can add Windows policies, SCAP, certificates, VPNs, etc. Wi-Fi. I can do managed browser policies, managed application policies. I can do computer management policies. We have lots of policies, as we discussed a little earlier on inside of the policy module. So having just kind of shown you where they all are inside of the UI again, let me go back up and select the policy I want. And I'm going to do an iOS email profile. So I'm going to create and deploy a custom policy. And now it's going to ask me for some information. So I need to provide a policy name. So I'm going to type in it says in the lab guide which is da, da, da. okay I'm going to type in email policy profile for iOS devices and the host because it's office 365 it's going to be outlook.office365.com and the account name is actually the name of the profile on the device so I'm going to type in something which is going to make a little bit of sense to the users, Contoso Exchange. Um, my username is my username. I'm going to get the primary email address from my uh, user principal name as well. And I can choose to turn on SMIME if I want to, and I can set encryption, etc., and how much email is going to synchronize. So I have good policy control over that. We'll say next. And now what's going to happen when somebody enrolls their iOS device, we're going to try and push down this policy if they're inside of the sales group, so let's add that. And this policy will automatically configure email for them on their device upon enrollment, which is pretty cool. If they've manually set up a profile, they'll be told that they need to remove the profile if the profile settings are the same. One of the cool things here is that adding that type of policy adds a managed policy. So I'm gonna go create a VPN profile now. I'm gonna give it a name. Uh, let's call it VPN profile for 
iOS. There we go. And uh, let's give it a VPN connection name. We're obviously going to have to provide details of how we're going to make this VPN connection and what it's going to be used for. So let me just make sure that we get the server name right. Then we're going to use uh, Contoso Intranet as the name because it is going to connect us into the Contoso Intranet. We are using a checkpoint firewall. We're going to use, uh, sorry, checkpoint VPN. We're going to use a VPN server name of remote.contoso.com. So let me just type that in. Slight finger click there. Oh, just let filter keys come on. Okay. Contoso VPN connection. And then that's the description. Let's type in the IP address, which is going to be actually remote.contoso.com. Uh, we're not going to, if we tick the box there, send all traffic through, that would disable split tunneling. That'd be a bit, bit uh, difficult for the users. It'd probably put a lot of extra load on there. We're going to authenticate with the username and password. And this is a per app VPN, so it can be assigned to specific apps, specific corporate apps if we wanted to. Let's hit save policy. And we can go ahead and deploy the policy again out to, I'm going to select the sales group. Okay. <coughs> so we're doing pretty well. We've now got a VPN and an email policy, which we can deploy out to devices. And we've got all the apps. So once a device enrolls, we're now going to be in a situation where we can deploy policy, where we can deploy applications for that particular user. So pretty useful stuff. And if you go back to the policy module, um, if you watch again on demand, then you'll find some of the other things that we can set in terms of just being able to configure policy for people so that they can have um, access to all of the right things on their devices when they're using them. So that kind of basically brings us to the end of the lab. And uh, we're basically, um, basically there. Hopefully you're, um, you've kind of learned a lot from, uh, from what we're going to do, from what we've done inside of this lab. And uh, hopefully you've uh, been able to get through it and get hands on. Uh, but as I say, if you've not been able to do all of that, then actually you're still in a position where you can run this lab at any time in order to be able to um, actually help yourself and do a little bit more learning along the way. So that really does bring us to the end of, uh, of the Jumpstart. Thank you guys very much for watching. Really appreciate it if you can fill out the poll that you'll find uh, at the bottom of the video section right now so that we can get some feedback on what you liked about the event, what you didn't like about the event, so that we can make sure that we do a better job next time and also so that we can uh, make sure that we're answering any of those particular queries that you have. Inside of the Q&A, we're going to try and answer any more questions that are in there. I'll hang around for a little bit longer and answer any of those myself. And uh, really hope you guys had a fantastic time watching this Jumpstart. You can go back and watch, whenever you want, the Azure Active Directory Core Skills Jumpstart. Really suggest you do that because there's some things like the ability to create users inside of Azure AD that we've done inside of this lab and inside of the rest of the course that you really, really need to get a good handle on. Next month, as one of the episodes inside of the, Azure, inside of the Enterprise Mobility Core Skills Series, we're going to be taking a look at Azure RMS, Azure Rights Management Services. Really, really key service in order to be able to secure information wherever the information happens to go. So come back and join us for that in around about a month's time. And you can find details of how to register inside of the window that you're watching all of this from. Thanks very much, and I'll see you next time.